All right, welcome to episode number 62 of Killer POV. And brace yourselves, listeners, this is the non-horror episode. But don't turn it off. What? Stay with us. Stay here. Yeah. Wait, no one told me. <laughs> it's going to be good. Hot damn. But I have pages on Return page. of the Living Dead. No. Nope. <laughs> Keep nope, in mind, keep in mind, it. before you write a negative review under this particular episode, <laughs> that we were going to just take this week off and have a week off. This is true. Yes. But instead of doing that, we thought, you know what, we want to do something a little fun. And if you care more about, you know, getting to know who we are a little bit more, yes. this is going to be a great way to do it. And yes. it informs our horror love. And I also, I have to say, even though that the, and I realized this as I was going through, even though that the films that I have selected for this episode are not horror, I see horror why I like them oh, yeah. in relation to the horror genre. Cause I'm looking through it. I'm like, man, that's a dark film. Well, that's well, a dark yeah, film. Yeah, What's yeah, wrong with me? Every, yeah, was, and also the era we all were grew up in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that was the, the, kind of the, the, the whole point of this was, you know, I, I think Elric had first mentioned it when we were in Texas um, saying, you know, we're like, we're 60 episodes in everyone kind of has a feel for our horror genre tastes because we always, you know, talk about them every week, but it'd be fun to do a non horror episode. Um, I feel like our listeners will get to know us a lot better if they know the type of films that we like outside of the genre, which got me thinking because, you know, I'm actually excited for this episode because I have no fucking clue what Rebecca watches outside of genre. I've not, never had a single conversation with you about a movie I'm that wasn't a genre movie. Uh, I so I have no idea what is going to be on that list of hers over I there. think she's never watched another movie. I, I don't think so either. I believe I tonight she's is going to be break. silent. Let me put it this way. She has a big white piece of paper with one title written in the <laughs> center title. of it. All it and says that's it. is Troop Beverly Hills The, the right Flintstones there. movie. Wow, the Flintstones, yeah. Actually, guys, I have to say this one was weird for me because usually I have two pages of notes for every show. I have Jesus, what is that, a novel? Uh, yeah. What's going on over well, there? My second out. page is kind of disturbing because that's all the films I like. I was like, oh, yeah, I like that movie and yeah. that movie and that movie. I don't this know if we'll get to it. This kind of weird. And then my husband and I got in arguments about some of them. And as I left, we, I reminded him of one and he was like, fuck it, I'm watching that. See, he's like home right now He's watching done with it, the good so. taste. When it comes to non horror I do like, I, me, no, and da- me, and, me and Dave's run more and more wow. together. Dave's got crap taste. He he's likes got good like taste. Jim Jarmusch and Wes yep. Anderson. And like, oh, yeah. it's going to be one of those episodes. He's a good egg, that one. So hopefully if you've been listening with us, you'll stick with us for this one and if not then just pretend we took the week off and you can come back next week skip it when we'll have another horror guest it's totally fine when you're listening to this on friday afternoon please drive to phoenix and visit me at the fango booth i am also doing a whole bunch of panels there and uh if you're mad that we're not talking about horror you can you can go to arizona (laughs) go to arizona and yell yell at rebecca personally and don't commit crimes kids (laughs) i just did five days of jury duty and i can tell you it was hell yeah and it makes you not want to commit a crime because the people deliberating on your crime are not the people you want deliberating no. on your crime no that's all i'm gonna say about They're that scarier it's true. I, I just got out so. you yeah. always picture the informed group of peers but oh, then man. you know i guess it's just like the assorted people who are standing in front of you at the grocery store line it's, and they're not the people i want determining it's the kind fate. of people who go oh well, the guy who's standing next to the guy who commit crime so guilty and you're just saying they go no i could stand next to a <laughs> criminal and it wouldn't make me guilty. and it just by the end your mind is melting and wow. you're like it wasn't as fun as the movies either right so we had a great judge and the first thing she said when we walked into the courtroom she goes now before you get excited this isn't a triple homicide <laughs> <laughs> and it was like it, she reminded oh, me the um bueller, bueller. Oh, really? yeah, yeah and she yeah, fell asleep Stein. twice in the case twice <laughs> the judge like the judge i was like this is great go so, go america oh so was God. it like a Polly shore movie it I was mean, a little bit the no togas uh which was disappointing Aww. closer to 12 angry men yeah it was a little closer a to 12 angry movie. men but with kind of even dumber people <laughs> right <laughs> Okay. There's, you know, there's some, there's some fun things to learn about the justice system if you've never gone through it, but it was also just like so pedantic mm. and like you're watching the attorneys do like really bad jobs thinking to yourself, man, maybe I should be a lawyer <laughs> <laughs> Every, and everyone's thinking that, not just me, like every juror is thinking the same thing. So it's, I don't know, it's a, it's a weird thing, but you know, justice was probably served. Probably. probably in that case, probably it wasn't a big deal case. So. Right, right, right. Well, but uh, thank God I'm done. <laughs> Drink that beer yeah. now. You drink that beer, you've earned it. I, we didn't even introduce ourselves. You should know oh, by now, yeah. I'm Rob G from Internet Icons of Fright, Rebecca McKendry. Fangoria. Elric Kane. I'm Elric, but tonight I'll be from Jump Cut just because of the movie theme. Ah. Yes. You know, because Jump Cut was designed with cinema lovers in general, not and, just horror fans. And that's that's why the name comes from... It does, yeah. It comes from, uh, well, it was um, it was it had been used before, but Goddard, the director from France, used mm-hmm. it. 
with purpose. He used it. He used, he used, used it. it. Well, he used it to show that it can be a style, not a mistake. In America, it would have been seen as a mistake. Godard. He like and Brett. Yeah, but who are you coughing about? Oh, I said he overused she was saying it. it. Overused well, it. Well, no, okay. he did. I mean, he used it in a way to show <laughs> that it could be used. Right. That was not a mistake. All right. Yes. Yeah. It's good to um, know. We are the best movie podcast out there now, <laughs> so please tell all your friends. <laughs> I hope you learned something on today's episode. Uh, yeah. But anyway, yeah, well, we, we have a lot of just random categories, and we can go off that, and we can throw new ones, like what's a favorite actor, or who do you follow, yeah. and just be all over the place. And I will say this might be one of the episodes where you kind of want to listen with your pen at the ready, which I be love, fair. because we always get emails from people like, you know, I have to listen with a pen at the ready, because I'm going to write down 50 titles that I have to see by the end. And I think we're going to throw a lot of crazy shit at you. I'm going to ask something that I didn't put in the thing just to start because I I don't know if you're going to remember. Elric emailed us a few kind of a few starters, and some of them are there's a lot like uh, Rob was saying before. There's a lot of overlap through, yeah, because that's just how we experience things. But I did have this one, which is what's the first film you remember in a theater? That, not the first that you necessarily saw, yeah. but do you have any like very early theater oh, yeah. recollections? What, what Mine was E.T. because oh, nice. it scared me so bad. Um, and it wasn't the alien that scared me. It was like at, towards the end where the men in white suits mm-hmm. come in to try to take E.T. Oh, away. Oh, yeah, it's frightening. Scared the shit out of me. And I screamed and my parents had to leave the theater. And I have vivid memories of them having me out in the lobby trying to calm me down so they could go back inside and finish watching. What year is that? I wonder how old you were. Probably I like gotta look three. that up. I want to say I was maybe three or four. I'll look it up. You guys go ahead with your memories while I oh, yeah. research. God, I, I mean, I can't really rem- like. I definitely. I wish I remembered what my first theatrical movie is. I definitely don't. The one that stands out, and I was pretty darn young. Uh, I remember my brother, my older brother, taking me to see uh, Back to the Future. Oh yeah, its original run, and you know. What was that, 85? So I was probably... So that's where you definitely would have seen other things before that. It was about that nine. Age. Yeah, yeah. I, you yeah. Know, like, cause I, rem- I feel like I remember E.T. Like E.T. That, you know. was 82, so I would have been three years old. But but I feel like Back to the Future is the one where... I, and we didn't see it like right away. Like It was right. a few weeks after it came out. Uh, that was the one that I remember... I, I, it, I felt like I was watching something special. Like oh, yeah. It felt like an event. Go, like to go to the movies is fun. It was a chance to go out. And if I was lucky, we'd get ice cream or McDonald's or something afterwards. Yeah. But that was the first movie that like wowed me. And I had so much fun watching and, and, and just, uh, yeah, I mean, and it's, I mean, I'm wearing a back to the future t-shirt right now. It's one of my, I bought still one every of my favorites. Huey Lewis record after like anything Huey Lewis or tape. Well, I was a tape guy when I was a kid, but I remember buying, you know, whatever the Huey Lewis <laughs> and the news albums were. And yeah, yeah. I remember my sister thinking I was insane. Cause mm. I was just like this, what probably seven year old who was into Huey Lewis, but yeah. And you know, that the, song is so good. The other strong one was, uh, you know, it was funny cause Cliff McMillan, who was on last week was talking about when he worked in the theaters, how back then you'd have to wait in line all day. And mm. sometimes if it was a big movie, you'd wait hours I distinctly remember uh, going to Sunrise Multiplex, which uh, became famous as in as the urban theater where somebody died during the Godfather three and they <laughs> a shootout. That was near where I lived uh, back in Long Island. But I distinctly remember Return of the Jedi. It was the first Star Wars movie I got to see on the big screen, and it was an all day wait. Like we oh, got wow. there early in the day, there were lines wrapped around the theater into the parking lot. And I mean, I don't remember anything about it other than we, we waited like two, three hours online to get in. We were so excited. It didn't mm. matter. Like that was when that was what you were doing that day. Like, what are you doing? We're going to the theater. It's 11 a.m. And we're going to see Return of the Jedi today. I don't know when yeah, or what funny. time, but we're going to go and we're going to see it. Uh-huh. And I distinctly remember being in the theater and just like everyone reacting and you know, once Darth Vader like turned on the emperor, like the whole theater like oh, yeah. got up and started cheering. And I was just like, Oh my God, this is amazing. So, yeah. Cause that's yeah. 83. Uh, probably for me, it was probably 84. Cause I think I was back in New Zealand. Um, my first memories, that's my, that's my, probably my second return of the Jedi is like definitely the one I remember the most, but I, I'm sure I must've seen a cartoon like, or, mm-hmm. or Snow White or something, but something, my yeah. first memory is Gandhi. Whoa. And, and, and I, and Your parents I, took you no, to see Gandhi? My, I, know, I know for a fact, it was like one of those memories you just burn into your does brain. Why not surprise me the yeah. you know? that Gandhi was like a first theatrical aunt. movie? It's like my mom's sister who's like, I don't think she even goes to movies. And maybe she had to look after me for a day or something. And she took me to Gandhi. And I just remember skinny Indians. That's all I really remember. <laughs> and I remember suffering and peace. And then I remember being very happy when I finally saw Return of the Jedi. Wow. Okay. <laughs> because it, but it, but I, and I've never understood why I saw Gandhi. I have to confront her. Fave childhood yeah. movie, Gandhi. Yeah, no, wow. it really definitely wasn't a favorite, but it was just, yeah. But Return of the Jedi is the one I, I think in my, Return of the Jedi and then Crawl. They're all they're the two that like early experiences I just Krull remember. Crawl was not in 3D. No, yeah, I guess not. I'm disappointed <laughs> by that. But with Return of the Jedi, like you remember that. I remember the pit. 
Mm. Uh, what oh, is yeah, the pit yeah. called? That's a great, yeah. I remember that really well. Sarlacc that pit. and Rancor. Yeah. Pit, yeah. 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 It's hard to forget Rancor, but there's something about that pit that was far more, you know, it's that unknowable danger. What is down right. there? And, it belched. Yeah. It was fun. But it was, uh, and, and Leia, you know, before you are before you know you want it, you wanted it. Yeah. You're, it was awkward. <laughs> right, but... Becca? <laughs> yeah, totally. I felt it. Her boobs were good. Yeah. 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 Um, but you know, it's funny cause a lot of people, uh, don't cite that one as their favorite of the original trilogy, mm -hmm. but I, I stand by it. I love it. I think mm -hmm. it's a fun movie. Everyone always jokes like, Oh, the stupid Ewoks. And I'm like, was, well, I don't know. When I was a kid, they, I didn't yeah. mind that so no, much. It was, kid, it was fantastic. the one that I watched the most. Like I can still recite Jedi more than any yeah. of the others and tell you, you know, like beat for beat what's going to happen yeah, just I, because that's the one I watched on repetition. It, it had the most exciting you know, opening 20, 30 minutes, yeah. like yeah. the whole opening getting Han Solo back was great. And then, you know, to me, I love it because it's a story of a son. It's redemption. It's yeah. a son yeah. saving his father. And I always, and I was, I was loved that. the bar scene and the band and it had all the different monsters and critters and everything. Yeah. When I remember I was the a kid, toys. Well, of that one too. I do yeah. remember the toys. Well. I mean, band. I still I think empire is an band. amazing movie. I mean, you know, Emp I agree. I probably saw Jedi the most too as a kid, but empire is just still like, it's like that Godfather two of movies where it's just such a good movie. That's hard to overlook. But yeah, Return's fun. I, I definitely would never be a Return hater. I think it's a great movie. Yeah, yeah, especially now with uh, the well, other ones. Except <laughs> I hated when they added that Jabba thing, just like everyone. Oh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was just ludicrous. The yeah. tripping over the tail? Oh, my or? God. Just Aww. the CG of it. The whole thing was like, what is this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll get the originals. I, I heard a rumor through that Disney's going to probably re-release the original yeah. versions finally on Blu-ray or mm. something. So, so that leads point. us directly to childhood favorites. So what are those movies that we watched as kids... A lot. And we were kids who were pretty much when we probably were about five or six, we were just entering the, the kind of the VHS uh, generation. Mm -hmm. um, so seeing these films mostly on VHS, I, I saw films in a weird way. There was like a local school that taught teachers. I think mm -hmm. we called it a like teacher training college in New Zealand. And every summer they would, every day, I think they would screen a movie on 16 and it would be like a newish film and all the local kids would go for like a dollar and we just sit there. So we'd see things like romancing the stone or whatever wow. it was. And wow. it was a really cool way to see movies as a kid. I think I probably saw a lot of them that way, but, um, so what are, yeah, what are some of the ones and we'll just, I'm sure a lot of them will be uh, bleed over. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Cause you know, you just brought up a very vague memory. I think there must've been something like that mm. at the community center by me where you'd go like on in the afternoon and they'd screen something. Uh, but for me, on top of the video stores, um, you know, we, we were, we were, we had HBO really early on. We, you know, my parents invested in cable and a VCR and, you know, my dad was always on top of, you know, movie related stuff right away. And I grew up in a household where I had like older brothers, like way older than me. Mm. Uh, so they exposed me to a lot of stuff I shouldn't have seen yeah. uh, when I was yeah. young. My love of comedies comes from them showing me things like, um, easy money, uh, bachelor party, revenge of the nerds, oh, yeah. things that I was way too young to even understand What's what that, they were. Um, Eddie Murphy stand up raw. Oh, raw. raw. I remember delirious. seeing that with an yeah. older yeah. brother and just being like, Whoa, the language. You so, know? Yeah. Some of it just, I mean, what, what's been fun about that? Like something like easy money, which is, you know, Ronnie Dangerfield. He's one of my favorite comedians. One of the funniest movies ever made with Joe Pesci. Every single line is a dirty joke. And I mean, I must have been like seven or eight when I saw this movie. So I just thought it was funny because my brothers were laughing. And I remember revisiting that film as an adult. And <laughs> the first joke in the whole movie is it's like he's a baby photographer. So he's at like a little girl's birthday party and they're all going crazy. And he's like, all right, all right. Who's the birthday girl? And she's like me. And he's like, how old are you? And she raises her hand. She's like, I'm this. And he's like, yeah, call me when you're this. Okay. <laughs> you know, wow. 20 yeah, yeah, yeah. 20. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh my God, this movie, I can't believe my brothers let me watch it. And then like he dropped, he pulls out the bunny and drops a joint and she's like, what's this? And he's like, Oh, nothing. He just dropped a few carrots. That's all. <laughs> and I just like, not that I, none of that made sense to me as a little kid. But as an adult, I was like, Oh my God, why'd they let me sit through this stuff? <laughs> it's pretty amazing. But I, that was the cool thing was, you know, I mean, my parents weren't really paying attention, but my brothers, um, for better or worse, did not filter me when it came to mm. comedy, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, childhood films are funny. I mean, obviously I, Star Wars is the biggest and probably the most important thing I saw as a kid. I think I sort of five or something and mm -hmm. watched it every day kind of thing. So it had a huge, I'd say Ghostbusters was pretty close. Yeah, behind. Mm -hmm. that was pretty big. That was a big one. You know, for kids, it's often the, the movie you see that you then go play at the park or whatever, and you're pretending to be the characters. Oh, and, yeah. that, and no wonder the merchandise flew off the shelf because, you know, it just kept. And again, we were, we, we were really lucky to grow up in a period of fantastic films because, you know, in the 50s and 60s, not like the films 
had that kind of imagination either. You know what I mean? Yeah. There would have been so much. And the 60s and 70s are all, you know, which is probably my favorite periods as we get, go down the thing, but not for kids. No, definitely you not. You know, not for kids films. So the 80s is really like the high point for young adult and kid minds, I'd say, mm -hmm. you know, but um, some of the, I mean, you know, Teen Wolf, Back to the Future. Yeah, you mentioned actual child movies. I, I, yeah. I'm watching like adult comedies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, I grew up a huge comic book fan. So, of course, you know, when Batman came out, you know, 1989, Tim Burton's Batman, mm -hmm. that was like huge. That was you a know? big one for me, too. I remember playing that. Like we would all like the neighborhood kids, we would all gather at Kimmy's house. I remember and we would always play Batman and who got to be Batman and who got to be the different roles. And we were familiar enough with the characters outside of the movie that we would pick roles from that. And yeah, it was a big deal. Yeah, it, it meant a lot to me. And I, I just remember Batman was at the time and I think it might even still be the record. That was the movie that I went to see more than any other. Mm. Like, I'm pretty sure I went and saw Batman at least four or five times on the big screen when it was out. And, uh, and I mean, it had a huge, at least here in the States, it had a huge turnaround. Uh, you know, videos, you know, things would play theatrically for a really long time, you know, or get re-released. And then if you're lucky, a year or two later, it would come out on video mm -hmm. or, or, you know, be on cable. Batman was a movie that came out in the summer. And I remember distinctly, they rushed it as a Christmas Price to own release. It was you know, 1999 to own it by Christmas, which is within six months, mm. which at the time I remember being such a huge deal. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that if you wanted to own a videotape, then it was $99, $99.99. And that's because that's how the rentals, you know, thrived is because the people that own the stores would buy those tapes for a hundred bucks and then they'd rent them out. And eventually over the course of, I don't know, a month or whatever, they'd make that money back. Um, and they priced them that high so that you wouldn't own them. Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted the, that was how the rental business thrived at that point. But then somewhere along the line, you know, I think might've even been with Batman. I don't know if that's the first, we'd have to look it up. But, um, I remember there were big blockbuster type movies that ended up becoming like, no, 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 no. Everyone needs the option to own this and we need to price it. It was know. a lot with Disney too, because they would open the vault. I remember that right. was always a big deal yeah. when something would be released from the vault. And like, then my parents would shell out like 20 bucks to buy me Cinderella just because mm. you could now own it. And yeah. Things like that. Yeah, no, it was a big deal. I mean, look, $20, $20 in, in, you know, 1989, that was a lot of money. It was, you know, we, well, my parents, uh, don't go arrest them, please. But my parents <laughs> bootlegged a lot of movies um, just because, well, we had one of the very first VCRs. The thing was like the size of a microwave. And um, when you'd open it, like eject it, the entire top would lift off hmm. and then you'd push the tape in and you had to use both hands to push it down. The DeLorean of it VHS. It was. And it was it ha like now you think like VCRs or DVDs, they sit on top of the television or, you know, nearby. This thing had to have its own like stand separate from it because hmm. my parents had one of those old wooden console TVs and the VCR was bigger than the console TV and had to sit next to it. But they had spent a fortune to get that very first one, but they quickly learned how to do tape to tape dubbing. Yeah. And this is like back early eighties before copy guard became a big thing. So everything that we rented, we had a copy of. So I grew up with this ridiculously huge mm. library of movies to watch constantly. Yeah. No, my um, dad was the same. He, he, he did either we'd copy it or because we had HBO, he would tape everything. That's what we did too. Every movie that came on TV, we taped. So a lot of my movie memories from when I was a kid, I can remember exactly where the commercial pause was because we'd sit there and try to pause out the commercials and so I remember oh, yeah. exactly like where the break was and a lot of movies because I saw them like that when I was a kid I didn't see them unedited until much much further down mm. Um, hmm. But my childhood movies are a tad different from your guys. I assume uh -oh. it's gender based. Um, <laughs> but Last Unicorn was a big one for me. I think you talked about that before, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah, definitely yeah, yeah. got some that. horror elements. I mean, uh -huh. it's a wizard who captures all of the unicorns, and there's a, a flaming bull. I remember, yeah, and I remember. A harpy, and I think it was in development recently a remake of it, a live action version. Uh, mm -hmm. That's been rumored, yeah. yeah I remember seeing something. My about. daughter, um, I was so excited at Kamikaze last uh -huh. year because the writer of it was there, the guy who originally wrote the story, and my daughter puked on him. Nice. It was brilliant. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Um, so, yeah. But um, that was a big one for me. Anything the Muppets did, mm -hmm. even to this day, they can do no wrong in my eyes. It didn't matter what they did, I, I loved it. Including um, their spin off Meet the Feebles? Yeah, I love Whoa. Meet the Feebles. I, like <laughs> I liked that one more when I was in high school. Um, Dark Crystal was a big one for oh, me. Yeah, Pretty yeah. much anything Henson did, because I'll also throw in like Labyrinth was in there. Um, oh, you just made me remember Never Ending Story, which Never Ending I hadn't Story. written down, but that's way up there. Yeah, in my childhood. I loved that movie when yeah, I was a incredible. kid. The nothing used to scare the crap oh, out of yeah. me. Oh, yeah, it's a terrifying film. At the end, it was yeah. freaky. 
And then um, I was into musicals when I was a kid, but you guys probably figured that just because of my love of musicals anyway. Mm. Um, but the adult movies that I used to watch, um, the National Lampoons, European Vacation, and the regular um, Wally World one, I absolutely loved. Watched them on repetition. Weekend at Bernie's, I thought was the most hilarious huh. thing in the entire <laughs> world. I burned holes in that tape watching it so much. Yep. Um, Pretty in Pink, Breakfast Club, any of those. Oh, kind hold of... back. We've got teen films oh, coming yeah. and comedies no, no, coming. But these were not teen okay, films for me oh, because okay, I kid. watched them when I was a kid. Okay, I mean, fair. I'm like yeah. five and six watching these All things. Right. So I'm watching, but it was definitely like an emulation. Like that's what I wanted to be because right. they were in high school going through stuff and going to prom and having feelings. And I thought that was awesome when I was in elementary school. Um, and then there's a couple of, well, I'll get to that in a sec. Hairspray. John Waters Hairspray was a big favorite of mine. Oh, yeah, I never saw that when I was young. I and, again, that. it's one of these films now that I'm like, I should probably shouldn't have been watching that when mm-hmm. I was so young. Cause it still has these weird John Waters esque tones to it, but I loved it when I was mm. a kid. Um, murder by death is kind of a weird one, but oh, that's like that comedy, uh, who's that? Peter, Peter Falk is that? It's a comedy. I don't even know who made the film, but it's, um, a, it makes fun of 1970s murder mysteries mm-hmm. and it's like a comedy murder mystery thing. I loved that movie when I was a kid, like used to watch it over and over. I, I did. And, I don't know if, did you guys have birthday parties where you'd go to a friend's house and watch a movie? And that was like the big thing. Cause when I, for me, that was like the, I don't know if it was where we uh, were in New Zealand, but like that was the thing you'd do. You'd go play some games and then everyone would sit there and watch a couple films. All of ours were at roller skating rinks. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For me, you know, it's funny. And we, we did this with every family tradition. It like every, Every birthday party, you know, for my, my, whether my parents, my brother, whoever, we'd order a couple pods of pizza, Mm -hmm. we'd eat that, and then we'd have an ice cream cake. Mm -hmm. And everybody, and then systematically, we would take pictures with every, you know, like whoever the birthday person was would have to take pictures with these cousins and those cousins and then this uncle. Mm -hmm. And Uh so, you know, we, we have all these pictures from each and every birthday, you know, pizza slash cake party that we had to celebrate. We never did the movie thing. Well, no, that was the reason I bring it up is because what would happen is you'd see a movie and I had some repeat years where the movies were so strong. Like my top three that repeated birthdays, and I'm not kidding, <laughs> uh, Big Trouble Little China, repeated nice. two yes. years. Uh, my science project was maybe my ultimate, like if you've asked me my favorite film when I was a kid, besides Star Wars and stuff, my science project, for whatever reason, Dennis Hopper is the time traveling history, history teacher and stuff. Uh, that film just held a special place, but the, the biggest, and it's still a bonkers movie when I, if you rewatch it, but at the time it was my favorite, just it was so amazing, was Time Bandits. Time oh. Bandits, That's like on my, list. my head spun around. Like I remember being a kid going, how can you even do this? Like, how does, how does this even work? Like, who are these midgets? What's going on? That one that hit film. me in teen years. I'll get to... Uh, yeah, the, the Time Bandits was one of the... And then Lady Hawk a little bit. Lady Hawk was a movie... I, I couldn't tell you the first thing about it now, except for who was in it. But I, at the time, I, I remember having a real incredible atmosphere. And, you know, it's just, those movies that were just like, they're borderline adult... But also, if you see them as a kid, they're magic. Mm-hmm. Like Time Bandits, that's magic. I mean, yeah. Um, and Big Trouble, you know, we obviously talk about that. The you one know, film I saw that was, uh, was her? Oh, on Big Trouble, just a oh, cool yeah. fact. There's a hat shop on Burbank Avenue in Burbank right now that has the, um, the Winds hats from mm. Big Trouble in Little China on display mm. there. Like we were oh, driving wow. past and Dave freaked out and was like, that's the hat of the storms from Big oh, Trouble cool. in Little China. And we had to stop and they're the actual oh, hats cool. and wow. they're on display there in the window. <laughs> so go by and see the storms hats. But the one adult film I saw during that, I mean, I did see a lot of Alien and stuff was an early one, but the one film I really shouldn't have seen, because I, like you had older brothers, um, when, and it's actually to this day, almost my fa- one of my favorite American movies ever. I just think it's an amazing movie. I saw Deliverance oh. at about the age of like, ooh, maybe eight. And I just knew what I was watching was like, I knew it was super intense and probably the disturbing parts, maybe like the rape and stuff weren't, maybe didn't even affect me as much because I probably didn't know what was happening. Yeah. But that film to this day, I watched it again a couple years ago. And I got to say, I think it's the best film ever made about masculinity, about men stuck together. And it's just an incredible film and the acting and everything about that film uh, made by a Brit. But it's, you know, like the, mm. to me, it's like the ultimate American movie mm. about Americans, like, you know, in a, going down this river before it's gone forever. And it really, it's never left, you know, my kind of top 10. It's one of those movies. But I remember it so young. I remember, I just can remember the banjo. I can remember, you know, all the kind of, and yeah. I remember Burt Reynolds. That, that's one of the key memories, you know, young Burt Reynolds. Wow. Um, but that's definitely, you know, far too young. 
I think um, I saw Flashdance way too young, mm. but I think a lot of girls <laughs> from my generation saw oh, yeah, that, that same huge. thing. Just because she was she wasn't a stripper, she was more of a burlesque dancer. But a friend mm. was a stripper, and there's a lot of sexual. Well, not, they're not overtones. There's a lot of sex oh, yeah. built into the plot in that. But a lot of females of my generation were allowed to watch it because it was about dancing. Mm. And um, yeah, I definitely saw it way too young because I remember asking my mom questions about stripping and why they were <laughs> stripping and why guys were giving them dollars and why they were in their underwear. And yeah, and my mom probably handled it beautifully. But I remember specifically questioning why that scenario was taking place. I wish I could see that conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure it was brilliant. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, before we move into th any favorite teen films, do you have any more of the key childhood ones for you? Um, you know, because you guys were mentioning uh, some of the fantastical stuff, mm -hmm. like, you know, whether it's Muppets or, or Dark Crystal. Uh, you know, I, I loved, uh, you know, I loved Flash Gordon, the, uh, the original Flash oh, Gordon. Oh, really? Interesting. Still, I didn't really still, still to this day, it's one of my favorites. And I try, I do own it. I bought an import uh, DVD of it just because it had different features and commentaries and stuff. But I actually try my best to only see it when it plays on the big screen. Wow. Um, yeah, I've seen it a few, because every, every other year it plays somewhere. And I remember the last time it played was actually... The new Bev paired it up with Conan the Barbarian, oh, wow. which was an awesome double feature. You're right. That's probably actually another one I would have probably seen when I was young and yeah, kind so of blew I my mind. Lo loved Flash Gordon. Conan, I didn't fully understand, but, uh, you know, Masters of the Universe, I grew yeah. up collecting oh, He-Man. Yeah. My dad brought me to see it and he was laughing the whole time because he thought it was a comedy. I remember you know? seeing that in the theater as well, the Dolph Lundgren one. Yeah. And I mean, you know, because of, because of what we're, you know, because of our genre interests, I always liked... Um, things that skated the, the, you know, monsters and stuff. So like, I remember King Kong lives mm. being a huge deal mm. because that came out in like 86 or so. It was like, you mean the Jeff Bridges one? No, there, that, it's a sequel to that. Oh. The Jeff Bridges one was 1976. Yeah. And I remember Jessica seeing that Lang. as a kid with Jessica Lange, which is the best she's ever yeah, looked yeah, in a movie. A one, yeah. Uh, they made a sequel to that huh. in the mid eighties starring Linda Hamilton. And it literally continues from the end of that one where they keep him alive on like life support, <laughs> like it's some weird thing. And he comes back alive. And I remember the big gag back to the feature was out at the time. So the big gag, if you look up the teaser on YouTube, King Kong lives, the end of the teaser is King Kong stepping on a DeLorean. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, it's, kind of, it's kind of amazing. <laughs> that's yeah. Fun. So I haven't seen it since I was a kid. I own it and I've been huh. wanting to revisit it because I, but I know it's not going to be good, <laughs> but still, uh, so those are kind of like the fantastic kind of films that I like. Have then. you guys had those where like you have this vivid memory of a film from your childhood and then you go back and watch it and realize it's crap regularly. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, but up. have you had the ones where you go, you have the memory and you go back and it's not even the film. Yeah. Like that's the weirdest. You're like, Oh yeah, that one great scene. And then you watch the movie and like, where was that scene? No, I've had so many of those. And actually Dave had one um, where he kept telling me that it was this Jonathan winters claymation film called Pogo for president. Huh. And he was like, oh, no, it's great. We have to watch it. And it's not available on DVD. And so for Christmas one year, I paid 50 bucks and got him this like out of print VHS copy of it. It's awful and uh, incredibly subversive and just huh. uh, very political and just huh. man. But he had just these vivid memories of it. So. Yeah, I mean, everything. Yeah, everything's when you see it. I, I really f I can't thank the 80s enough for our childhoods. I mean, in the sense of just. Uh, it's not just horror. Horror, obviously, that's the major. I mean, we're we're cutting out horror from this conversation, which is kind of hard to do it given is. the crossover. Yeah, but that's real. When you know, when you go from Time Bandits and things like Big Trouble and Lady Hawk, that that all bleeds perfectly into the genre stuff that was being made. But it's so there's nothing like this now. Like when yeah. I'm thinking about something like Time Bandits, I'm like, who's making a movie like that now? No one. Not a movie like well, that. Not saying that's 90% imagination, 10% studio. You I've know? long said that the problem that we now see in modern film is that we no longer leave this world. Instead mm -hmm. of saying, okay, well, let's take time bandits and go to a completely different planet, universe, you know, right. belief system. Instead, we stay here and allow the fantastic to enter our world, largely mm -hmm. because it's cheaper. But um, right. yeah, that is where. But then again, I don't watch a lot of kids programming yet. So, um, I mean, I... Like besides Gravity Falls, I don't have much. Yeah, but home. it's a different kind of kids program because these movies, uh, I could like these movies as an adult the same. You know, Ghostbusters is for adults and kids. That's yeah, true. Yeah, you know. That's so true. nowadays, kind of I don't know what comedy. You know, I don't know what a good a good example of now is. I mean, obviously, superhero here movies are the closest thing that are aimed at both. It, you know, it was weird because we grew up in a, in, in a weird time where, you know, at least genre, you know, when we were kids getting into our teens, you know, like we've always mentioned, genre was getting really you know, uh, fantastical and supernatural and doing weird things and chances. But we grew up in a time period where 
Arnold Schwarzenegger was a star. Right. <laughs> and it's the like, biggest star I mean, you on the planet. Like, I watch those movies now with a lot of uh, a lot of nostalgia, and I still love them. But The Running Man is not really a good movie. I love, I love, love it. Rob, I love it. I love, I love it. I love it. But uh, you no, might be wrong on that one. The I know, opera I, singing I, Dynamo. Listen, I mentioned it on the show once, and somebody I forgot who was here was like, "Oh no, that was before." Oh, I think it was Mick Garris that one yeah. time. Where he was like, "Ah no, I I was too old for that one." Came yeah. out or whatever. Uh, but you know, like uh, the same way that things like catching a little glimpse of like uh, American World in London, I like right. I couldn't make it through that movie because of it. The violence, like yeah, Commando took me two or three tries because like they were like executing dudes in the streets and shooting yeah. them down. Like, and that was like the, the era of squibs. And plus the way Bennett dressed, that was a little well, too, yeah, too much. Little. Come on, Bennett. Come on, Bennett. Let us yeah, some there's, uh, there's like, some weird stuff going on there. But. Hunger Games, I think is probably a good example. But it's example. humorless is the problem. Like, yeah, I mean, the, like these movies are good and they've got, they have that same kind of, like Hunger Games is actually pretty well made. I thought the second one was actually a pretty good movie, but they don't have that sense of humor that I think almost all 80s films had, even if they were serious, they always had know. this weird yeah, look, look at Commando and the original RoboCop. Uh, I'll tell yeah. you Nothing yeah. matches the yeah. tone. I'm intentionally yeah. trying to approach this without doing a, our generation's better no, <laughs> it's concept. True. But so it I'm is. trying yeah. to find a way to prove that modern entertainment is just as good as and what we failed. watched when we it's were yeah. I'm still working at it. I'm going to get Luckily to we're it. Luckily we're pre-CGI. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's where we got lucky. But um, let's, yeah, let's move team, into team films. And these can be short. Like, what were the films? And we'll just stick to, like, the ones that you really, like, just loved. And one of them, yeah. me and Rob, I'm sure we'll ha- share the same one. And the we had a guest here related oh, to yeah. it. I mean, when it comes to my, like, one of the first I remember, you know, Better Off Dead yeah, yeah, by yeah, Savage Steve summer. Holland. That's why it was almost otherworldly when Savage Steve Holland. I think listeners are probably like, oh, that was cool, that one episode you guys had that guy. It's still one of my favorites it's we've like ever done. A guy wow. I never in a million fun. years would have thought I would have met in my lifetime. See, yes. I never even saw yeah. that film till I was like almost uh, done college. And then it was wow. like, oh, wow, the guy who made One Crazy Summer had another film. Let's go back no, and watch it. No, that was one of the... the that, I remember yeah. that trailer earlier than... the One of the first VHS I remember watching had the trailer, you know, where they do the <laughs> damn shame when folks be thrown away a perfectly yeah. good white boy. And that just burned in my mind like I need to see that movie and I think it kind of um, follows through with my taste in comedy now when we get down to comedy because I've always had a surreal bent to mm-hmm. the humor I liked and we, even if it's high art house uh, surrealism but I think it starts with Better Off Dead because I think that's one of the stra- that and Weird Science are two of the oh, most surreal yeah. movies I think in comedy yeah yeah well before we delve directly strange. into comedies you know yeah, yeah, te- like, teen our teen years are, are when you know this is when we're our most impressionable we're trying mm-hmm. to find ourselves you know, and I feel fortunate because in the early nineties is kind of when, you know, music just exploded in a way. Mm. Like, you know, I, I liked I liked all kinds of music. I liked pop. I grew up, you know, liking Michael Jackson and Prince, like everybody else did, because that's what was on MTV. Um, but then you know, and then like my older cousins were into like metal and some of the hair bands and stuff like that. So I just like rock. I just I just like to rock. But like in the early nineties when like Nirvana came along and just changed the whole landscape of that, it just, it opened my mind in a lot of different ways. So I just, I love that time period because that's when we were, uh, you know, impressionable. And, and up until then the teen movies that meant the most to me were the John Hughes movies, Yeah, yeah. you know, and I think that's just for everybody. Uh, he could be the first director. Like I know one of the, the topics you brought up is what's the first director you noticed. I think to me it was John Hughes because that's when you realized you know, I'd, I'd seen The Breakfast Club and related to it in a strong way. Weird Science is still my favorite. That's, you know, that's a little bit more and, on and the And Breakfast Wilder Club side. is just so rewatchable. And then, and like, then you find other movies that you keep relating to in the same way, like Some Kind of Wonderful or, you know, at, you know Becca mentioned Pretty, Pretty Pink, Pink before. One of the ones I loved wasn't serious. a huge... See, I didn't think know he was a director at the time. I thought it was what teen films were. Yeah, I thought his films were just what yeah. The I Sure Thing was, was the trend, one I loved. But like St. Elmo's right. Fire was in there too. Yeah, 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 all those movies. All that was kind they of had era. a commonality. And The Sure Thing, I remember seeing that one on TV with Daphne Zinnigan and John Cusack. Yeah. And they had to drink a beer by putting a hole in the bottom and then uh, you opened up the top and the whole beard. That's I don't, called shotgunning. Okay, shotgunning. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we didn't have that where I was. So <laughs> I was super impressed and wanted Daphne Zuniga bad. Um, I didn't have long to wait because Melrose Place came on soon oh, after. But, there you go. but, the, but you see, I would have just thought, oh, The Sure Thing's by him too. You know what I mean? And yeah. Even though it's not. So. Yeah, there was. Whereas Better Off Dead was different. That I knew wasn't by him. It, I could tell it was. By oh yeah, that there's was, something yeah. wrong with. And Better I think Off that Dead. was. That I mean, that's why Savage Steve was stood yeah, out for me. A, I just I discovered him a little bit earlier because, as I've mentioned, that was what that and and the original Nightmare, you know, because they both had uh, Amanda Weiss in them, mm-hmm. are what got me into both oh, of those genres. I didn't know that. Yeah, right. no, I don't I, remember I, you saying that. I told the story before, and I'll just say it really brief. It was just my cut. You know, I was like ten, and my cousins. Uh, 
were to- I'd sleep over at my cousin's house who were a little older and they'd torture me with the story of Freddy Krueger and constantly tell me about that movie. And they finally got me to watch the first nightmare and it scared me so bad. I, I just, I couldn't, I, I reacted really terribly to it and they were scared that they fucked me up for life that they immediately put on better off dead to prove to me Tina's still alive. She's in this movie right here, breaking John (laughs) Cusack's heart. It's going to be fun. And that, and, 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 you know, unintentionally they started, those are the two things that, that, I mean, those are the two films that changed my life. Like I've always loved the genre because of that. And, and just like pretty much eighties comedies, like everything in that time period was just like, it was just much like the genre. It's so fantastical. You yeah, know? yeah. It, and there's you nothing know. like missing one. I, I don't think I ever saw She's Having a Baby. It's um, okay. Which is, no, that's a no. One. That film, I saw it again, when, but when we were uh, having our first kid, and that film... It might have been the really? best. It might have been one of the best films I've ever seen in my See, life. I saw that one I, in college. It, it was knocked just like my the socks off. Shady one, right? No, 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 no. The, uh, no Kevin uh, Bacon. Kevin Bacon having Molly the kid Ringwald? with Molly. No, no, Molly okay. Ringwald. Um, What's her name? Isn't it the girl from Big? There were two remember. movies back to back. You're thinking of some kind of wonderful? No, there were two. Uh, there was one where Ali Sheedy was pregnant. And there was one where Molly Ringwald was pregnant. It's neither of them. It's Kevin Bacon, and it has the best line I've okay. ever seen in a. I think John. I think it's John Hughes' most personal film because it's all about a guy in Chicago. He's having to do like illustration work for a corporate corporation just like what Hughes had to do but right. there's a line where he's getting married and he's outside in the car with Alec Baldwin and Alec Baldwin yeah yeah that's it Alec Baldwin one of them says it to the other I'm not sure if it's Bacon or Baldwin where he says this is the happy the guy's really worried and down about everything he goes this is the happiest moment of your life you just don't you just won't know it yet you won't right. know it for like 20 years and it's really there's something so bittersweet and sad about being in your happiest moment, but not being happy yeah. that it echoes through all of John Hughes work. Like, yeah, totally. And, and that film, which I don't think I saw when I was young and I'm glad I didn't because it's so adult. It was perfect to see if anyone's out there expecting watch it, put that she's having a baby, put it in. And it just like, you know, you're always in that stage. You're never ready. That the whole thing. Oh, we're not ready. No one's ever ready. Right. You're, you're, you know, you're Elizabeth either doing it. McGovern. Elizabeth McGovern. Yeah. Okay. And, and yeah. I might weeds. be dreaming my Ali Sheedy pregnant one. I'm looking back through right now, trying to figure yeah, chances it out. Chances are she's pregnant in something. Yeah. But that is <laughs> yeah, an excellent film. I don't film. think it's she did well an Oops, I'm Pregnant movie. I think that was definitely. I don't remember what something, some kind of wonderful. Well, is that Eric Stoltz? Yeah, yeah, she uh, did Eric Saltz and um, uh, Mary, was yeah, it Mary, Mary Stuart, Stuart Madison, mm-hmm. who's like the drummer, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he and he wants to take out Leah Thompson because yeah, she's yeah. like the popular girl. Or whatever. Want. Leah Thompson so cool. Well, you know, I was I was always siding with uh, for him hooking up with the drummer girl, oh, yeah. but uh, but no, I mean that's that's the thing, and that's the beauty of the John Hughes movies now. In retrospect, is now he made enough of a filmography where something like she's having a baby makes you know more sense to us as adults right. now. And you know, I it just he was the first director where anything that came out with his name, like career opportunities, which is terrible. I haven't seen that one. <laughs> I went to, I mean, Jennifer Connelly's in it. It's, it's the best she's ever looked in a movie. Mm, it's like after wow. it was just, wait a minute. She was, the rocketeer just texted and said, oh, come on. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> let me, let me rephrase. It's the best she ever looked in her post teen phase. Okay, all right. You know, the rocketeer, she's yeah, a woman off, off the charts. That's when yeah. she became, you know, yeah, became yeah. a woman and all. But um, anyway, the whole reason I actually brought up, you know, cause that was the teen part of it. But the whole reason I brought up kind of the, the change of the times in the early nineties and, and just the music scene is uh-huh. because that's, you know, when you're in high school, that's when you're looking for the cult films. That's mm-hmm. when all of a sudden your taste change and you're like, you know what? I want something different. I want stuff that's not the norm. And, you know, that's the time period where that's, that's where I discovered Clockwork Orange, you know, like, well, that goes more to the question I was going to ask, like, what's the biggest shift in your, yeah, I guess it's like the biggest shift in your taste in a sense, right? Yeah. Because, well, I mean, I have two, I mean, okay. that, that's, well, we'll come back to that part. Yeah. That, to me, that was impression because it's like, I'm watching Clockwork Orange and that's, that's what helped, you know, I watched that movie and it named my band while I was watching it uh-huh. at the time. Um, and then, you know, stuff like, um, you know, River's Edge was from the 80s, but oh, yeah. I discovered it yeah. in the early 90s, and that just seemed like kind of... It's a, it, it holds up, too, man. That, great that film's a yeah, weird we, movie. It's great. We just bought that. We watched it, like, right over Christmas, I remember, and I hadn't seen it before, and I loved it. That director ended up doing a lot of The Sopranos. Oh, I, really? I often would wonder what... I think his name's Tim Hunter. I yeah. often wondered what happened to him, but he directed quite a bit of Sopranos. Right, and then, I mean, this, you know, early 90s was uh, The Professional. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, Leon, when True, I really True Romance. got like into that. Gary Oldman yeah. and uh, Romeo's Bleeding, which is another one he did that's around a, that's that time That's a pretty period. wild one. Lena Olin. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, crazy in that movie. Film. Yeah. yeah, that's a weird one. I it's like, it. he's a cop, she's a cop killer, and, yeah. and they fall in love with each other or whatever. I had one to dial back, back into teen, just because I was curious if you guys, did you have a... Do you remember a first date movie or even if it was a bad date, like you went with a girl or a guy? Do you guys have a memory? I do. Well, I've got to get through my teen movies Uh first. Um, But my first date movie was Wayne's World. Oh, nice. Yeah. (laughs) How did the date go? 
I, I think that was also my first kiss that night. Nice. So, so yeah, scored it. Mine was way too, I was, I was young and it was first time any guy, I was always just hanging out with my guy friend and then just some girl goes, do you want to go see Pretty Woman? I saw Pretty Woman. <laughs> oh my God. And, and I, but the funny part is I'd seen it the day before with one of my friends. And so I went the next you day pretending I hadn't seen. So right. I saw, it's pretty embarrassing to think I saw Pretty Woman twice in two days in my lifetime. But, um, you know, not yeah. a bad movie. Most of my teen movies, um, well, my teen years were definitely odd for me because that's when I was, um, I can say most actively consuming horror because it's mm. all I wanted to watch. And I know, and it's weird because I was a cheerleader. I was an honor student. I was like everything that I was supposed to be, but all I wanted to watch was horror. And then the other films that infiltrated into that were these kind of, I misunderstood teen movies, um, like pump up the volume oh, was yeah. quite possibly like the mantra of my first few teen years, like from, I'd say like seventh grade through 10th grade. I love that. I would recite it for anybody. That was the most poetic thing I'd ever seen. Talk hard. Yeah. That and Heather's, um, I mean, Slater definitely was hitting his yeah. stride for our generation. Welcome to the dollhouse was a big one for me. Heather Montserrat. Wasn't that a little later though? That was, was, like, I feel like I was 20 or something 90s. when that, no, I, I think I was 20 when that really? came out. Todd Solondz, say, yeah. like I was at the end of my high school. That was years. during the birth of the kind of Sundance movies. Yeah. Cause that was a whole indie Sundance thing, which is I've a little got different. Suburbia on here, empire records, but I'm a cheerleader. These were all these kind of like, yeah, you don't must be 20 by those misspoken yeah. quirky movies i really loved those because days um, and confused is before suburbia yeah and and i remember that well i also it's not a movie by any means but the state the mtv tv show if you had asked me for my entire high school career what my favorite thing in the world to watch was i would have said the state and horror and that would have been it that would have Never summed up it. everything really? you have heard of we didn't have mtv i know oh, you have true. because david wayne was sitting in your restaurant one day and i freaked out because he was there and i was like the guy who made wet hot american summer oh and i know what you, that is okay he had a tv show on mtv the guy who made wet hot american summer was that jump gun and i looked at him damn yeah <laughs> <laughs> selena was excited okay, about it damn i, I missed um, that but he had a, a tv show on mtv in the 90s that really just defined my sense of comedy huh. That and Kids in the Hall. So those two um, were big for me. And then this was also the time when I discovered I have a really big love for car movies, which never comes up on here because car movies, car movies. Oh, do you see car, car. wash? Car, not car wash. No, car wash. Things. <laughs> my <laughs> teen years were where, um, and it's still one of my top five movies ever. Vanishing Point. Oh yeah, that's a good movie. And Four Lane Blacktop, definitely. Two Lane. Two, uh, sorry, sorry, two I'm lane. staring at it. Oh, two Lane. Yeah, I mean, you two just lane said Car Wash. That's five. used cars. And you just said Kurt Russell. Oh yeah, used cars. What's used car, car wash. wash. Car Wash is the one in the Jack Richard, Warner? Richard Pryor. I thought yeah. Warner in there. Oh that. my God! You just reminded me of my like in my top few all time kid <laughs> films, uh, the toy. Oh my oh, God! The... And and Brewster's Millions. Those two Richard Pryor films oh, yeah. shit, are two of my Millions. favorite. But the toy, especially the toy, left a huge like Richard Pryor was like one of my favorite things growing up because of that film. Man, if for you hadn't was, said his uh, name just then, I would have totally. For me, it was see no evil, hear no evil. That was wow. fun, yeah. And I like Gene Wilder too. I, I so actually yeah, yeah. A very early, uh, when we talk about movies we shouldn't have seen. A Lady in Red was oh. one of the first movies I remember seeing in the theater, and wow. I knew that I shouldn't Gene see it because it's yeah, it's got yeah. that hot girl with the the dress blowing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same girl from Weird Science, Kelly right? yeah. LeBrock. Kelly LeBrock. Oh yeah. Um, a big game changer for me since we were getting into mm -hmm. those that happened um, right around my senior year was Princess Mononoke. Um, which have you guys seen? You're looking I at have. me. I know confused. what it is. I just haven't seen it. Okay. Yeah. Cause prior to that, Miyazaki had had like mm. my neighbor Totoro mm -hmm. and that was definitely more of a kid's film, but princess Mononoke was anime for adults and it was very, very heavy. And, um, Jillian Anderson was one of the voices. Mm. I think Claire Danes was one of the voices, but I mean, they definitely kind of Americanized it for it to come over. But I saw that right around the time I was graduating high school. And that was a big kind of like, holy shit movie for me. Mm. I loved that one. I didn't get into anime, but it definitely yeah, it kind of, anime. it twisted my tastes a little bit. You know, what makes me sad is cause, cause when I read your email and one of the topics was first date movie, mm. I thought you meant, uh, like, if I was about to go on a first date, what would I show somebody? Oh, well, that's fine. Forgetting that you're both totally married with kids oh, yeah. and all this stuff. So when you were just saying, Oh, my first date in high school is that uh -huh. I didn't go on any dates in high school. When, oh, well, when I didn't was your have first? a date movie. Well, that sucks. Aww. I didn't. None. If but I have my first date movie that if somebody wants to go on a date now. Okay, what, would well, take them to see them. what would you take them? Uh, I bet you'll get offers too at the yeah. end of this episode. Somebody's going to call and be like, take me to see. It's either True Romance. Okay. True that's always romance. one of my favorites uh -huh. to start off with. Or uh, Before Sunrise. Nice. Oh, yeah. yeah, they're both good. Yeah. Very cool. Even though I prefer Before Sunset, I'd rather not jump to the cynical, more right. realistic movie yet. But uh, yeah, link later we'll get into a little bit further down the line. Yeah, if it makes you feel better, I, I once went on a date to City of Lost Children. Can't remember any of the movies. 
<laughs> That's all I'm saying. Wow. Hey, now. That well, was a good movie. <laughs> I will say yeah, that um, there are two movies that brought me and my husband together because when Dave and I met, we met doing theater stuff in college, but we mm-hmm. were really drunk at a party and like we'd vaguely known each other through the theater department. But really drunk at a party, we started quoting Last Boy Scout to each other. Uh, and because that is one of my all-time favorite movies. I got to read. This must be a killer Shane POV Black, screen because I saw this when I was like young and made no impression. Even how though do you, how, I was a big Bruce really? Willis fan. I love Die oh Hard. I, I, I love Moonlighting. Die Hard is on my list and too. Shane Black, I love, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. see, when I was young, I just remember watching a movie going, oh man, I like Damon Wayne's Bruce Willis. Bummer. And, and it didn't work so, at all. So I need to, to I need to revisit it. It is one of those movies that Dave and I will always hold sacred because it's, and we even like tried to figure out how we could name like our kid, like Darian or something to work right. after it. Just because if we have to say there was one thing that brought us together, it was That's the funny. fact that both of us could quote that movie endlessly. Isn't Daniel and Harris? Like, Daniel Harris is yeah, Bruce Willis' daughter. That's crazy. <laughs> oh my God. That's pretty wild. There's so many great lines. Bruce Willis says to everybody, head of gut. And what you realize throughout the movie is, He's giving. He's gonna punch you. He's giving you a choice. Do you want to That's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. And then I remember I think this I one a part where squirrel last night <laughs> spilled my warm cup of piss. Yeah, I love. I like Damon Wayne's a lot. When you, will, you will love it if you watch it now. It's yeah. a maybe great, I need to wait. That's a theatrical a moment. Film. I think That's I need to see that one. in theaters. Oh man. Yeah, if that I ever comes that's what I think, well, I told Dave, because um, our 10-year anniversary was last year, and I was like, we should do like a public screening of Last Boy Scout. And then we, yeah. we were like, we were going to have to run a theater, and this is going to be a big nightmare. And we don't know who would actually come to a theatrical screening of Last Boy Scout. Me? But now I'm like, okay, you know what? Yeah. Fucking 11-year theatrical screening of Last Boy Scout. Let's do it. It's happening. I like it. I have it's somebody great. Can find it. it. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the first director you followed. Would yours be Hughes? Like that you first, and I mean consciously, like I guess as a kid, the nice thing about movies before you know you want to make movies or be part of anything like that, it's just not, not you just kind of a movie washes over you. Would you remember the first one where you were kind of like, oh, it's a movie and I want to make movies or that's interesting to me or, you know, I want to watch all of their work, any of those kind of things? You know, it's weird. I mean, not not genre necessarily, but I think, uh, and you know, these are obvious choices and I, I feel differently about a lot of these filmmakers we're talking about now. I mean, Hughes for sure, mm-hmm. um, but no, Tim Burton, you know, because yeah. because... Batman meant so much to me as, as a kid because, you know, it's freaking Batman finally. And then, you know, and then you realize, I'm like, wait, that's the same guy that made Pee Wee's Big Adventure? Like, Pee Wee's Big Adventure is a movie that I know, you could say any line from that movie right now, mm. and I'll know that it's Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Right. It's just one of those films that's just indelible because you remember everything about it. And and I guess you start to see this person's imagination, you know, and then you see some of the other films that that uh, Tim Burton did right after that. And, and, you know, Edward Scissorhands and perhaps he's actually a great analogy of the change in cinema. You know, like we look at him early on in the eighties and early or late eighties, early nineties. And it's all the things, all the amazing things we're talking about in film in general of the fantastic. And then you look now it's about remakes or reboots or, or, you know, developing material based on another thing. And, and it's all very safe. And his films, the comedy of them feels a little tired right now. Yeah. Besides Frank and Weenie, which felt like a nice return to form, but it was very but small. Because it was already yeah, something from small, the beginning of his career. But so I think yeah, there's I mean, something around, to that. Around, around his Phantom of the, uh, not Phantom, what's it called? Planet of the Apes remake yeah. is kind of where he just, you know, lost. What, I think Sleepy what I Hollow is the transition, but I love Sleepy Hollow. I love Sleepy and Hollow I think, too. But I think it's the one where like, as soon as that one ended, I feel like from there on, it became very different. What right. about like yeah. Big Fish? Yeah, I, I also Big Fish thought, is cool. I think that's Big, a fluke, though. I think Big Fish was just a script that came. Like yeah, it's but a John it was, I thought it was a really. I you know I remember seeing Big Fish and an early screening of it in Manhattan. You know, and it was like around December, so it was like you know there's light snow everywhere. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm you know I'm not too far from you know Rockefeller Center, and we you know I went to go see that movie and was just blown away because. It was like the first not really Tim Burton movie. It had that style to it, kind yeah. of. I just, I thought it was a beautiful and kind of magical movie. I think that would have been a great period. film, no matter who was going to make it. I don't feel like a, a, yeah, yeah. that needed yeah. to be a Tim Burton film. Exactly. It was yeah. a great Regardless. script. It was a great, you know, very strong. What yeah. about you? Uh, we were doing the first director you really kind of noticed and followed. Um, John Waters. Oh, yeah. Definitely. That's good. Just, I was from near Baltimore, and he always had this kind of legendary quality there. Mm. And yeah. so. Yeah, he was a big one for me. Terry Gillum was another one who I'd mm. paid attention to, um, his early stuff with Monty Python. And then also, um, I would say David Lynch. And At a was, young age? Yeah, pretty early on. See, like for me, it was there was only one. I mean, Kubrick came a little bit later, but not much. But like for me, I think I, I might have said it before, where I saw these short films by uh, Polanski. That was at a, it's in New York city. It was at a, I, I was traveling there and it was a short films from all their film schools. Mm-hmm. And they were just so 
<laughs> unique, these short films, and you knew you're watching movies, not that a movie was like uh, something you couldn't touch. It was something that you could tell these people use their hands to make. And with the editing, you could tell they use their hands. And I hadn't seen films like that yet. And then I l looked them up after I saw these shorts and saw like Knife in the Water, uh, Cold of Second Repulsion. And after that, I mean, I think he was my favorite director for a long time. I mean, I read all the biographies on him. And, and then that led to things like Lynch and Kubrick, uh, definitely Kubrick first. And and that really took me down, I think, the, the begun the rabbit hole of maybe auteur worship, you know, like finding directors and then watching everything they made yeah. and reading yeah. every book about them. I mean, that's how my entry point into like, especially the non-genre uh, stuff. Do you have an, another, like besides the director, do you have a film besides when you're really young, but like as you're getting older and because you guys ended up doing writing or journalism, do you have a film that you saw that really opened up you to like maybe thinking more critically or like more like how you would write about a film? One of those movies where you're watching it kind of shifted you or even just a bit movie that kind of shifted your taste. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think for, you know, I mean, I already mentioned it, but it, it's weird because we, you know, my brother's, you know, obviously had friends that were a little older and they would come over. And one of the fun things was I'd always have long discussions with them about movies. So like even early on, we were, you know, anything that we saw or that was big or popular, you know, when for me, it was like, we were analyzing the back to the future movies. Like mm. by, by the time the sequels came out, I was a little older and it was like, I just remember trying to go toe to toe with time travel, you oh, know, cool. yeah, philosophy with my brother's friends and be like, no, 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 but this doesn't work because in part one they did this and that doesn't work in part two and three. It's actually funny. I actually started a back to the future debate on my Facebook page mm. that went on and on and on because I, I, I explain how two and three don't work because they're breaking the rules they established in part one. And essentially, uh, I'll just tell it really quick now, since uh, since we've already spent a lot of time in Back to the Future. But you know, in the first movie, the the example that they give in terms of how time travel works is that um, you know they put Einstein in the car and he jumps one minute into the future, meaning he disappears for that minute to arrive one minute later. Okay, so he's not there during that minute of time period. So by their rules, there's no way that in part two they can go 30 years into the future without arriving to a future that they've been gone from for oh, 30 years. Do you know what I mean? Cause they'd, yeah. they'd skip over that. Maybe they're just gone for one minute and 30 years past. You know, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's the That'd fun of, that's the yeah. fun of time travel is you can argue that point, huh. you know? Like that. So that was one of them. And the, you know, the other was the end of two where, you know, in part three, their problem is that they have to be going 88 miles per hour at the same time as having the fuel on the thing. Whereas at the end of two, it gets struck by lightning, hence giving it the energy while it's just hovering. Hmm. So I'm like, but they broke their own rule. They just said they had, it has to be going 88 miles per hour for it to work. You, you just definitely, blew my you mind, know. Rob. Yeah, sorry. you definitely thought more about wow. this than I had. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I've had years to think about it. I, haven't, I need to see the second and third again. The third, yeah. I remember being lukewarm on, but it would be I like the third better than the second. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah. but, you know, it's the, the problem with the sequels is they just they refuse to bring back uh, Crispin Glover and, and yeah. you can't deny when you watch the first one, he's, he's, amazing. he's just as important. Yeah. I mean, yeah. him with Michael J. Fox is mm -hmm. what makes that film as special as it is. My yeah. mom, um, saved every paper I ever wrote when I was mm. in school. Cause she was so like cool. academically proud of everything I did. Um, but the one that I love still showing people, um, is my mom saved a, um, we had to do a report on a movie when I was in elementary school and had to be set up like a book report and I gave it a negative review. And so it was, the movie was called Mac and Me. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah, it came yeah. out just um, right around the ET age, I would say probably a little bit after that. But it was made pretty much by McDonald's, which huh. is why the main character's name is Mac. Like he was an alien who loved Big Macs. And there's a whole dance sequence in a McDonald's and everything. But I gave it a negative review and up at the top and even because we had to give it like a headline, like a newspaper article. And it says Mac and me is lousy. And <laughs> um, So, yeah, I always mom always is like, I knew you were going to do this from the start. But even like in high school, I wrote um, a paper on the comedic um, style that was set up in Kentucky Fried Movie and Amazon Women of the Moon because I was obsessed with them when I was mm, in high school. Wow. Yeah. And um, so I wrote a paper about the kind of montage vignette style that they did so yeah i kind of i like talking about movies way back when you just reminded me the first review i ever wrote was in junior high school you know it's funny because you watch all these like teen comedies and they like have like oh yeah they, they have the newspaper department like I, I remember having trouble trying to find who the hell was in charge of the school paper because i wanted to write i was like oh i want to write <laughs> i and was the, editor the first thing was uh teen wolf 2 t-o-o -O, hmm. the sequel with which um, uh, with jason. jason bateman i just wanted to see it 
And uh, and it was awful. That was boxing, right? Yeah, boxing. Yeah, it was just of the same basketball. movie. And I I can't remember what my review was. I'm sure it was just like it was pretty good. Yeah, that's all because I was editor of my school's newspaper, and we did reviews, and that's all it was. It was like, yeah, it's pretty cool. That's fun. See that yeah. we didn't. I didn't do that, but I had this one teacher. I think it was 14, turning 14, and it was the first time anyone had broken down like the elements of a movie mm. ever. And it was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And which I hadn't seen, and that besides besides just loving the movie and Jack Nicholson just being at the best thing he ever did, in my opinion, he would you know he started breaking it down. So why are they all wearing white? What does that mean? What are the wh- white walls that the director has chosen to put white walls? But this is institutionalism, and, and he would break down all these like things, and that's the first film analysis I'd ever come across. And then we followed that pretty closely with Alien, and doing the same thing though. So very in- you know pretty intellectual, but it was for yeah. like you know like an English class. And it blew me. It opened up movies in a way that has never like that's the literal moment for me where movies became a different thing. Yeah. They became something I could look under the hood and go, oh, it means something and that doesn't always mean literally that, but it can mean stuff. And I, you know, I love that feeling and I still love that film for that reason. You know, it's it's such a rich thing when, you know, I wish teachers, you know, there's more teachers out there like that who can unlock something for you and you just go with it. You know, yeah, totally. But a great movie it still holds up. Uh, in terms of shift of taste, um, oh, yeah. That's what you're you know, it's, on. it's, uh, uh, for me, I remember very distinctly, it was, it was in about like 1997 because, you know, 91, 92, that's when I was getting really into music and, you know, and I, I'd, you know, dabbled in looking for cult films and all that, but there was a period probably by 94 where I was just out of the movie game totally. And just focusing on my own band and just music. I actually, like, 94 to 97, I just didn't watch movies at all. Mm-hmm. I stopped. I just, I was going to every single show I could go to. I was going to New York City, like, every other week, catching every band I could think of, just because it seemed like I didn't want to miss this. There was so much great music happening and all that. So I totally fell out of love with movies for a short period there, and it was just all about music. And then, you know, there I guess there's a genre push that that pushed me in there, but the first time I remember going back to the movies was you know, I think Scream came out in December of 96, mm-hmm. you know, and that, that was kind of like what drove me back into movies then. But I have a very distinct memory. Um, I had two, two buddies named Pete and Matt that were huge movie buffs. And wait, so you missed face off. <laughs> Holy shit. No, I think face off was just before Scream. I, I saw, I saw, <laughs> I'm sure I saw it. I don't remember. If, I don't God. think I saw God, it. We were worried. But, it's all right. But, um, no, so the three, we went, I remember distinctly, we went three nights in a row to the movies and the three movies we saw were As Good As It Gets, first night, Titanic, the second night, and the third night was Good, uh, Good Will Hunting. And again, this is a good four or five years that I just wasn't watching movies at all. And for better or worse, I was so moved by all three movies. You know, I mean, think about seeing those three mm-hmm. without being in a theater for four years and then just being like, oh my God, like, you know, and a little bit hot on the hell, you know, tale of you know, Scream had just come out and that redefined the genre. So it was like, man, I kind of love genre movies again. And then seeing these three distinct movies, but they, you know, all three of them are, are, you know, pull, pull on your heartstrings kind of movies. Right. So I just remember being very emotional by the end of it. And that's kind of like, you know, I mean, think about it. I miss Tarantino. I, you know, that's, mm. that's when I was like, Oh, what's this Pulp Fiction thing about? Oh, oh so my you missed God. Reservoir Dogs wasn't on your no, radar. I mean, that ah. was like nine, you know, that was what? 93, 94, yeah. 95, yeah. that period. I, I wasn't watching movies. It wasn't until then. Cause then, then once I saw those three, then I was like, oh, what else is going on? And and it was funny because I was watching a lot of what what has been referred to kind of like the post-Tarantino ripoff movies, but not thinking, you know, like I love things to do in Denver when you're dead, yeah. you know? And really? that was that was the period. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember it, but I remember kind loving it. bored <laughs> by that one. <laughs> bored? What are you, crazy? Yeah. It's like an all-star cast. Everybody in is Christopher Walken in a wheelchair is like, a, a, like the mob boss. Uh, Trent Williams has got some of the funny shit ever. Maybe. Christopher, wait, Lloyd. let's re- let's redo it. An all star cast and Andy Garcia and Andy Garcia. I think I need to rewatch lead. this one. You do. I didn't dig it when I first saw oh, it. Oh no, it's a lot. I, of, I, I remember it was plugged quotable. like it was the next big thing, and it never really lived up to it. For you know, the box office never lived up to that. Yeah, yeah, that was the thing because they were trying to position it as a major like Tarantino ish world. Yeah, but I mean, me and my friends from that era, we still quote that movie. That's funny. I got to watch that again yeah. too. Yeah, yeah it's pretty great. It. I haven't seen it in a long time. But yeah, that was a cool little shift right there. You're lucky the, to yeah the to step late. back with Pulp Fiction. I mean that you was, know. and that, then and then I think Swingers was roughly around that yeah, time too. It was. And, and again, that, it's the rise of the indie. Yeah. it's a shift in the cinema itself. Finding you Clerks know? at that point. You know, this yeah, is a couple years shift. after uh, it actually slacker, came out. Slacker, slacker, and everything. Though. I never liked Clerks. I will admit that here. I liked Chasing Amy. I liked Mall Rats. Clerks, and I swear, my college roommates must have watched it 15 times a week. 
fucking hate that movie. No, Mallrats should hang in an art gallery somewhere oh. because it's perfect. I love Mallrats. Mall when I was I young, it. that was the best. I mean, I know yeah. Clerks is really, I think Clerks is funny, but you know, it's, it, 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 it probably has aged better than the others actually because probably. of the black and white and the uh, kind of stripped down uh, nature. Uh, well, Clerks was the first one that, that made me realize like, you know, well, first of all, I worked at a dairy barn, which was a drive through grocery store uh-huh. in Long Island. Those and exist. Yeah. It's, it's a chain in Long Island. And I think there's one in Burbank over here, but it's not, it's called something else like dairy something or whatever. How do you, hold on, how do you drive through a grocery store? Uh, I stand there. There's two, uh, there's two driveways and a car pulls up and they say to you, hi, I'd like a gallon of milk, a loaf of bread and cigarettes. But you don't get to pick your brands or your type. No, you tell them you're like, I mean, it was uh, all the breads and juices and stuff. We had our generic dairy barn version. Oh, okay. So, I mean, I think we'd carry like Tropicana orange juice or something like that. Okay. But you'd have to spit, you'd have to pull up. Wait, we said no horror today. This sounds horrifying. I'm kind of concerned (laughs) because I'm like picky about my cinnamon raisin, low fat, whole wheat, you know, oatmeal bread. How do I get this at the dairy barn? You pull up. And we probably have the, I don't know, whatever the main bread brand is that carry that makes that. And well, there's that's an it. app for it now. You can just <laughs> type it your, in ahead of time. That's your only option. But look, this is Long Island. People are lazy. They don't want to get out of their car. You know what? It totally blew was working in the winter months in New York because you're freezing in this little fucking hut trying to close the glass doors and hope that nobody pulls up. Because, you know, you have to go back and forth between both driveways. To That's a great people. setting for a horror film, though. Man. It like is, but I mean... in the snow you know, in a little booth. Yeah, yeah. But, it, you know, I mean, it was it was a fun job for what it was. But uh, if, you know, people are lazy and I would bring them their eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, my big shift in taste, this is where probably I get more diversion. This is where finally Becca can feel uh, like a champion and call me pretentious. Uh, but this film particularly is pretentious. I call your no, movies well, pretentious. This film, this film can be called pretentious, but I actually fell asleep in it many times, but it shifted. <laughs> My problem is unlike you who <laughs> fell out of cinema, I think I consumed too much cinema at a certain point. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, during film, like uh, my first years of college, I was watching three to four films a, a day. Uh, trying to catch up on everything. I, watching every film by every director was kind of my thing at that point. And I think I just had seen everything mainstream, all the big Hollywood Oscar films. So I saw, and I, and I was starting to watch some foreign films, but not many. I saw a film called Le Ventura, which is like called The Adventure. It's by Antonioni and it was booed at Cannes. Like, mm-hmm. a, like oh, everyone, it won, I think it won Cannes, but it, everyone booed it because nothing really happens. It's like an anti-narrative, but it's also really slow. And I remember falling asleep two or three times during it, but when it ended, I remember going, man, that was good. <laughs> and so I couldn't justify <laughs> what I had just said because I had literally fallen asleep. But that film pushed me in a direction in my 20s. Like that's like the bird, like 22, 22 to like 28. Mm. I think I watched every foreign film, every art house wow. film I could get my hands on and have literally seen like, you know, most of that stuff that would be available to me. And the reason was it was, you know, I still, I still love that. So I don't watch it as much. I think part of getting back into horror in such a big way, I feel like there's similarities between experimental films, foreign and horror. I think they have more in line with each other yeah. than the rest of cinema. Mm. Because well, they're, they're para cinema. Right. You can push, yeah, you're cool pushing things. Academic terms, para cinema. Yeah, they, they are. They're things that are challenging. They're pushing boundaries and artistically they're doing things that aren't necessarily real. Like yeah. they don't need to look real. And so, you know, uh, yeah, without going into all those titles right now, that was a major shift. And some of them will come in my favorite films, but. Uh, you know, and, but it was a big shift and I don't, you know, I look back and I'm really glad I did it, but it almost makes me now less likely. Like if I'm going on Netflix streaming, there's no way I ever touch the foreign section anymore. Almost because I think I saw again too much of that Yeah. to the point now I just want to watch whatever the latest horror release and just like tune out. I don't know. Uh, I also got dumber as I got older. So you know, my biggest, and I can't even call it a shift. Like there was no real big shift where I was suddenly like, I liked this and now I like this. But I like came out of the closet right after yes. high school. I know, I know. Talk about um, it. <laughs> not on. in a sexy way. I'm <sighs> um, sorry. No, but I mean, throughout my entire high school career, I was so just adamantly consuming horror every chance I would get. With but girls. because I was really concerned, <laughs> watching it with girls. Most of them happened with um, a gentleman named Ben who went to my high school, and the two of us were like best friends, and we watched horror movies together every single and night. That's not it all. was just. That's, let's be honest. That's yeah. not all you did. With Ben. 
But oh, oh, we're getting somewhere now. <laughs> now, now things right. are getting weird. Yeah, but um, don't worry, Dave doesn't listen to our show, <laughs> so it really doesn't matter. He, doesn't know. he has no idea but, what we're um, even here. No, I mean, and even after what little short-term high, high school romance Ben and I had ended, we still like it was weird because we ended up becoming best friends because all we did was watch horror movies together, and um, you know we didn't even hang out at high school half the time. But even as soon as we get school was over, he was be at my house. We yeah, were watching you know, a horror. Do you remember movie. there were friends? like that the friends that you wouldn't really hang out with at high school or be seen together and yet out of school you that you were the you probably spent more time yeah i find like, those friendships were the strongest in a weird way that's how it was because ben and i we didn't run in the same circles at high school but as soon as that bell rang he gave me a ride home from school every day and we would go straight back to my house and watch horror yeah i guess if you like live near five sometimes it's those neighbor friends yeah we didn't live near each other he lived like uh. a half an hour away but yeah huh. it was just it was like what we did and on weekends like i hung out more with him than some of the friends i had at high school so he ended up like He's one of my best friends in high school just because that's what we did together was watch horror films. But I did it as kind of like a weekend or I'll say more of like a closeted thing. Like my friends that I hung out with in high school knew I liked horror films, but not quite the admiration I had for them where, you know, it was just it's all I wanted to do. I always wanted and, to see uh, that character portray, you know, the, those uh, post scream movies like I know you did mm-hmm. last summer. I always feel, you know, the pretty girls who were like were the cheerleaders. I always think that would have been a did great. Did you just call me pretty, Elric? No, no, <laughs> not on air. No, making an I'm, I'm, I'm making an example <laughs> that if you were when you're, I didn't see you in high school. Thanks. Uh, but they never had that character. They're always just the no, the one note. And it would have been cool if one of them was that girl at school. And then when she got home, she was wearing like her death metal shirt and was watching horror with a friend. I no one ever portrayed Trays characters like then they should. It's the but only see, thing I liked me, about like I went to see Cannibal Corpse twice when I was in high school, but I would have oh. never told anybody that. But I went with Ben because he was really in, and we saw this band called Pungent Stench, who was also a death metal band. <laughs> yeah, right. We That's saw Sepultura a couple times, but I always went with him just because you know it's what we did when we weren't in school. But yeah, Ben, it, if you're listening, we want to hear from you. Thank <laughs> you. Tell us your side of the story. He's a police officer now. Uh oh, so respectable. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's. It was, that was the biggest thing for me is, um, finally I, I reached this point when I was a freshman in college where I just got sick of kind of being a cheerleader and an honor student and editor of the newspaper and everything like that. And I just wanted to be a fan. And, and now you're a horror overachiever. Yeah. I <laughs> you went from one overachiever to another horror. Achiever. <laughs> but within that, um, and because we're not supposed to be talking about our horror love, this is why that was playing in is, um, because I suddenly was ready to embrace my love of horror. It allowed me to embrace my love of exploitation films yeah. and just generally weird shit. And that's when I started just consuming all of these weird things. And like by the time, um, end of my freshman year of college, my favorite film was beyond the Valley of the dolls. I'm, and, I'm with you. I think yeah. I was more into exploitation and like I, my favorite is cult, yeah, like midnight exactly. movies. Even today, if you ask me even more than horror, I'd say I'm a midnight movie guy. Like I just love that whole spectrum and of that was, type of movie. There was a book that came out. I want to say it was from Video Watchdog. But Jay I, Hoberman's Midnight Movie? Uh, no, it was cult films. It was just like uh, a thousand cult yeah, films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just a list book. There's the Danny Perry one. There's I, a, It had a leopard print cover. I got to look it up. Because it was like best cult films of all time. And the Psychotronic time. Film Guide the was a great, a great one. Still great those. to have if you can. Yeah. I have the Psychotronic Film yeah. Guide, but those for me became like checklists when yeah. I was in college yeah, yeah. of going through and trying to watch everything I can. And I got to look up what the cult book was great because roadmap. I loved that book. Are you ready for comedies, Rob? Oh, I am so ready for I think comedies. you've been itching. Yeah. Favorite comedies, and this is now, not looking back in time. Let's, let's, this is all about where we're at now, but they, uh, some of them will still be the ones we loved as kids. Mm-hmm. What are some of your, what are your, some of your friends? Obviously, some of them have come up on the show before, but. Um, oh, man. I mean, you know what? Uh, the 80s, like the 80s comedies were always, I mean, I'll watch any comedy from the 80s, no matter how bad. And I have stacks and stacks because uh, my friend Brett back in New Jersey also shared my love of 80s movies. And we'd always talk and try to find the most obscure title. They'd be like, did you ever see Plain Clothes? Do you remember Hunk when it was on HBO? I'm like, no, I don't, I don't remember any of these. But, uh, you know, favorite, just one of the guys. I mean, oh, yeah. I, it's such a, I still love it to this day. It's, you know, and they, they've remade or technically remade it several times. But that one in particular was great. Um, Three O'Clock High is one of my all-time favorites as well. I don't know that one. You, you don't know Three O'Clock High? I've never even oh, heard of Oh, my God, we're watching Three O'Clock High. What is Three O'Clock High? It, I mean, it's just this kind of nerdy kid played by, um, what's his name? Uh, Casey, something with a long, weird. He's he's actually the guy that wears the 3D glasses in Back to the Future. Oh, okay. Somebody on out there will correct me at some point because he has a weird last name. But anyway, uh, he's the lead guy, and he goes to he just attend, he goes to school. He works at the school store. And this guy named Buddy Ravel, uh, I kind of bring up titles cause I, you know, 
he's the big guy. He's the big villain from Kindergarten Cop. Uh-huh. Um, let me see what his name is. But uh, anyway, uh, Buddy Ravel is like this this like feared guy that's starting school for the first day, and and his big thing is like, I heard he killed somebody at the other school, or I heard he punched a teacher. Just don't touch him. So of course, you know, uh, our lead character accidentally touches him, and he's like, you know what? Now I got to work this out. Three o'clock, we're fighting. And it's pretty much in almost in real time. Oh, wow. It's like going through the day of he's trying to figure out how to get out of this fight because he's this tiny, it's like a David and Goliath thing. It's mm. like, I can't fight this guy. He's going to kill me at three o'clock. Um, yeah, that so, sounds good. I haven't seen that one. Yeah, and it's from the director of, oh, hold on. I'm bringing it all up now. It's uh, uh, Richard Tyson is Buddy Ravel, the villain. And it's Casey Samasco, Samaskico. I can never say his name right. Uh, it's funny. I saw this not too long ago at the New Beverly um, because the director, uh, Phil Janot, uh, oh, yeah, also, yeah, you know, he, he did, they did a double bill of Three O'Clock High with U2 Rattle and Hum, which he also directed. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, Three O'Clock High is definitely one of my favorites. Um, and, you know, even though they have genre connections, uh, Summer School was a mm-hmm. big one for me. Um um, Morgan Stewart's Coming Home, which is one that a lot of people oh, don't know about. I love that movie. It's one of my all time favorites. Don't know that one either. John Cryer, uh, huh. he, you know, is he's, he's he's been sent to all these uh, uh, boarding schools his whole life, and his parents are in politics, and he's this like he's this weird horror kid. Like it, the shot, the the movie opens in his room on a shot of his Fulci zombie poster, mm-hmm. oh, wow. and then pans back, and he's got dial him for murder, and just like he's just this like horror nut that is stuck in all these boarding schools because his parents don't want him. And then, you know, the, the, his dad's in this political pa- campaign and they kind of bring him back because they want to like, they want to like do this whole weird campaign for like vote for the family, you know? So it's like, he's trying to make his family a family again, but they just think he's so weird hmm. and he's not. And the reason I like this, cause this is John Cryer, you know, from that period, you know, when he was uh, ducky in, in, uh, yeah, yeah, the John Hughes movie. Thing. So he, um, he's a normal kid. And, and I think that's what I loved about hmm. it. It was like, here's the first time I'm seeing a movie with a character that's not, you know, gothed out and wearing all black. He's just like a normal kid. He just really likes these movies. And of course I love it because he meets the girl of his dreams, uh, Emily, uh, Ooh. call me, call me M short, you know, to like dial up the Helen murder. Hunt? Why do I remember? No, 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 no it's not. She's okay. girls just want to have yes, fun. Which is another one I love from that period. Yeah. But he meets he the was girl. one of my film teachers, but back to school and, and that he, uh, Alan Metter, the Holy director of those two. Holy smokes. Uh, I hope he's not listening. Worst teacher in the universe, <laughs> but awesome stories. Like, right? He did not know how to teach, and he got out of there pretty but quick. But he made good movies. It was amazing. <laughs> he goes, oh, yeah, I discovered Helen Hunt or this movie, and then, blah, blah, blah. But Just one of the guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, girls just want to have girls fun. Girls just want to have fun. Uh, but yeah, no, in Morgan Sears Coming Home, he meets the girl of his dreams while waiting in line at a mall to meet George Romero. If wow. that's not okay, the I gotta, yeah, I'm going to watch that movie. Don't tell me anymore. Ever, then, I'm going to watch yeah. that movie. Yeah, uh, I'll fire one. through some of them I've talked about before. I mean, you know, my litmus test is if you don't like After Hours, like I have three three films that <laughs> I think I've talked about. If you don't like Better Off Dead, After Hours, or The Burbs, like one of those three, or at least two of those three, mm-hmm. then I just don't even, I don't need to know you. Like, we shouldn't know each other. We shouldn't meet on a rainy, stormy <laughs> night. Holy I smokes. will cut you. Um, I was going to say, I think I like two of those three. After one, Hours one, is my favorite Scorsese movie. I didn't, I didn't, Final like, I didn't like The Burbs when it came out. Well, that's but, fine. But, but, uh, but you know what? I appreciate it now. I just didn't get it. Oh, yeah. Because well, no, I was I mean, too young to understand That was what the, the first, even before Gremlins, when I saw that in theaters, I remember just being like, this is the greatest comedy I've ever seen. <laughs> I remember uh, doing that shot the, the, oh, the yeah, crash, the, to Joe Dante once. Oh, I yeah. filmed a birthday thing for my best friend who also, <laughs> and I said, can I film a little, can you say happy birthday? And I did, and I did the, ah, the verb shot. And he just you. looked up at me and he goes, he goes, oh my God, I'm going to die. And that's going to be what they put on my tomb yep. is that shot. But, yep. um, those three are really important to me, uh, but my favorite, you know, in the last like couple, you know, last 20 years, my favorite comedies, I think Big Lebowski is basically perfect. Uh, I think that film gets better every time I watch it. I just think it's like a marvel of comedy. Ed Wood, I think, is one of the best comedies ever made. Oh, yeah. that's, that's my favorite. Tim Ed Wood is my favorite far. Tim Burton by far. I think Bill Murray is amazing. There's just so much in that movie that is just it's perfect. It's a, a great movie. Mr. Mom's a personal favorite. Like Michael <laughs> Keaton in that movie, I love so much. I, I love that when I was like 15. Another I don't John know why. Hughes. That was a great Another one when John I was Hughes. A kid. But my fa- my favorite comedy. Uh, this is like my number one. It's called Modern Romance and. It's one I discovered later. I was probably like 28 or something. It's Albert Brooks. Okay. And I'd seen oh, quite a few right. of his films. I'd seen the one where they, you know, have the egg and the nest egg and they spend all their money in Vegas. And um, 
I, and I actually like every one of his main features, but this film, it starts with a film editor who uh, is breaking up with his girlfriend. He goes into the editing room with the assistant editor. He's kind of down, so the assistant editor, so he takes a quaalude and then starts just kind of going on a weird trip, and then he gets back together with the girl, and then they break up again, and then they get back together and break, and that's the whole movie. And he's a film editor, so they do film sound design. There are some of the funniest things I've ever seen about film sound effects, uh, editing, but also like relationships, but... Uh, Stanley Kubrick, the only reason I saw this movie is because I'd seen a quote somewhere where Stanley Kubrick called it a perfect movie. He thought it was one of the modern romance. It's modern romance. It's (laughs) Albert Brooks in this. And it's one of the maybe lesser known of Albert Brooks's, you know, the films that kind of got less uh, uh, intellectual kind of, uh, uh, you know, press. But it is just flat out crazy funny. Cool. Yeah, Um, check that one out. I love that film. And Dr. Strangelove is, you know, another one that's just that can make me laugh on any day. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the characters in that, and it'll be a different character every time. That's how great Peter Sellers, it'll be a different one of his many characters every time I watch that movie. It will laugh, make me laugh more than the other ones. So, but yeah, no, those are the kind of comedies, you know, I've always kind of enjoyed. I did find um, the Celt book that I was talking about oh, that yeah. kind of shaped me so much. It is Video Hounds. I said Video Watchdog, mm. not Video Watchdog. It's Video uh-huh. Hounds, Cult Flicks and Trash Picks by Carol oh, Schwartz. Yeah. I remember that one. Yeah, yep. no, that remember, one, yeah, yeah. leopard print cover. I The pages fell out of mine. I read that thing so much. So, wow. um, But my comedies. Um, this one isn't a film, but I wrote down Faulty Towers just because that... I oh, watched good. in repetition. Like my parents taped him when I was a kid and that and the old Monty Pythons, I would watch over and over. And this is where I say that it started informing kind of my horror taste. Cause my favorite Monty Python sketch by far is one called salad days, mm. um, where it's these like upper crusty British people having, a. a like a picnic and somebody knocks somebody's heads off and then somebody gets his hands chopped off inside a piano. Mm. And I loved that. I mean, one they're wild. So much. Like the big fat guy blows up and yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, those and now for something completely different. Those <laughs> That's what I always remember. Those. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. were kind of my fave comedies as kids. I mentioned before Kentucky fried movie, airplane and Amazon women. Oh, on the moon. airplane. Yeah. Airplane really? would and, be up there too. And actually right before I left, I was talking about Kentucky fried movie. And so right now Dave's home watching it with Mark. Oh, and now you're also reminded me of satire like naked gun oh my yes. god naked gun probably was yeah burned i yeah. think i like uh, naked gun 33 and a third the best out of all is that three. the last one the last one <laughs> it's i knew i they... knew like a midget at a urinal i'd have to stay on my toes That's, it's got that line yeah no they do i can recite forward and backwards Loaded weapon. Oh wow! Loaded, no, see, there, right? loaded yeah. weapon is fucking genius. No, I he shows up to the Oscars as Phil Donahue. Yeah, no, there's <laughs> that, some that really funny. Amazing. Yeah. So I wrote down Wet Hot American Summer, which I'd already discussed from uh-huh. the state. Um, Kids in the Hall, even the movie that they did, Kids in the Hall, Brain Candy. I love the movie that I can watch anytime, and I will still crack up just continuously. Is Clue. Oh, no yeah, matter yeah. Clue how is great. many times I see it, I will laugh. Yep constantly at it um so that one was amazing and then this one's kind of my i will defend it to the death death to smoochie that oh, man. i know everyone <laughs> hates that i did movie. see it no i didn't hate it i remember it being very dark the, the humor yeah. was very black and i liked that about it but um i didn't I've heard love so it. much negative stuff danny about devito that movie. directed it and ed norton's in it That's or did right, ed yeah. norton uh-huh. direct it yeah no, no, danny, no danny devito, devito directed yeah. ed norton and uh, uh, uh what's his name it's got john um, robin williams Oh, That's right. Crap. Yeah. Why can't I remember his name? John. John. Frick. Robin Williams? No. From Daily Show. John Stewart. Oh, John Stewart. Is um. in it. And i um, sorry. Brain stroked out for a minute. But um, yeah, I've always loved that one. So that's kind of my like, if anybody's like, you know, what do you hate? What do you love that everyone else hates? Death to Smoochie. Um, one that I always think is one of the smartest comedies is Election. Yeah. yeah election was I'll tell you great. a funny story about Election. I have, My friend loved it. And when it came out, I saw it on a plane and I thought it was like, it was okay. But I was like, yeah, it's okay. You know, I thought that was a pretty good movie. I liked it. Mm. And then he qu- then he went to me as soon as I got there. He goes, he just literally pulls me aside. This is one thing I need to tell you about Tracy Flick. It's that her pussy gets so wet. And I looked at him like, what's that from? He goes, election. I go, not the version I saw. And I realized oh. what I had seen, none of that X-rated like material or dialogue was in this version I saw on a plane. So I must have seen this like completely neutered movie. Whoa, and then I no saw wonder. it on video and I was <laughs> yeah. like, I was like, holy hell, how does that exist? Because wow. it was so adult. Yeah. Like, like it was so subversive. You That's know? such a weird And way it's still to... Alexander Payne's best film. Mm-hmm. Like whatever he makes, he keeps getting like Oscars, but yeah, yeah, or yeah. getting close to that's still well, the best. Great. Yeah. Sideways comes Sideways close. is really strong. Those yeah. two are both, they're a little less fun now you know the movies he's making now are still good and they make you kind of reflect on life but they yeah. do, they're missing a little bit of the funny humor of life a bit yeah yeah and but yeah no that's it is so weird when you see and it made me really realize oh maybe a lot of these films we see are being edited on plane yeah, yeah. no you it's know. crazy 
And my other ones I'll leave off because they're on my top 10. Which oh. we'll, do at the end. well, really quick with comedies, you know, for me, another big thing is bef- before I even followed directors, mm. I was, I was a big actor guy, you know, meaning, you know, I loved better off dead growing up. And then I loved say anything. A yeah, Cruz film. So I would watch movies solely based like when VHS became a thing that you could just buy, you know, like when it was affordable for 10 or 20 mm-hmm. bucks and stuff, it's like, you know, I would buy any movie that John Cusack was in because I liked even when he did dramatic stuff, you know, it was like, I own the grifters. Uh, on grifters VHS and I love the grifters. I just, because I just liked him as an actor. I was like, I'm going to buy all his stuff. Same thing. Christopher Walken. I mean, God, he made way too many movies at one point where I couldn't keep up with them, but I followed, I followed a lot of actors, but well, you're to, well rewarded up to gross point blank yeah. and high fidelity. Yes. And then suddenly those last two right after those two, they're both brilliant. I thought, Oh, this is still the same guy. And he's not that guy now. Yeah, I don't know I who know. he is. Yeah. Neither do I. Yeah, maybe we got some insight from Savage, Steve, when we did the show. Yeah. But, you know, it's, maybe I, I know was, a little more. I yeah. followed like Dennis Hopper for a while, which oh, yeah, leads Hopper's me great. to one of my favorite films of his that is kind of underrated, Red Rock West. Or just, oh, yeah. it was called oh, Red great Rock. Noir, great Noir. But, no, yeah. Red Rock West is what it's called. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great noir. Um, by Who directed that? The Red same Rock. guy did The Last Seduction. Mm-hmm. Um I don't even know. I just I, he did I some Dexter. He did a couple yeah, episodes we, we of had Dexter. Him, we had him, I'm drawing a blank. We had him on the Dexter podcast. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I've I've seen most of his films, and I just his name escaped me. But I I think Red Rock West is a really great yeah. neo noir. Uh, and Last, Last Seduction is really interesting too, but Red Rock West was Nicolas Cage. Which also leads me to another notch. person. John Dahl. John, John Dahl, yeah, yeah. Nicolas Cage is one of the few actors that I will see just about anything yeah. he's in just because he fascinates me. Yeah. And yeah. Well, that, he went know, from just being a great actor to then being this like out there person. Yeah, but you know, yeah. that that early, I mean, his early career when, oh, you, yeah. I mean, Wild at ra- Heart. Raising, raising Arizona, Arizona still raising Arizona. stands up as... Different human being, like physically. Totally. Yeah, I gotta yeah. say, Moonstruck. Yeah, Moonstruck's amazing beautiful. amazing in Moonstruck. Yeah, he's, yeah. He, there's no deny he's a great actor. Yeah. Yeah. No matter what Kiss. he's in now, it's okay, more it's just hard, like... But... It's more like a choice. There's been a choice at some point to get lots of money yeah. and do these big well, buffets, which is great, and he's, he's done it. He's got to pay off, you know... Yeah, yeah, yeah he's got lots of debts and stuff. But then he did the Herzog film, and suddenly you're like, oh, you can still act. I remember that being that moment being really surprised, like, oh, you really still have the chops, you know? I liked him in Season of the Witch. I mean, even when he didn't watch that one. I, I, watch that one. I missed that one too. I did not think That's it was definitely bad. a tax movie. His he accent. Like, oh, God, I, I can't watch his accent in like a medieval time. He's so Californian yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. God, God, God forbid that Superman movie ever happened with him. Oh, Tim wouldn't that have been crazy? That the Kevin been, Smith I kind of almost want to live yeah, in a too. world where that happened. Yeah, it would have been cool. It been. Have you ever seen? I I think they should do a skit with him. Oh my God. There is a great Nicolas Cage skit. I think it's on Funny or Die, but I'll have to look it up where with Nicolas Cage's agent. And it's just like this dude who's on the phone and, and like you, you, they keep changing the posters out behind him. Oh, that's funny. But essentially he's like, all right, Nick, listen, so you got an offer for a movie. I'll do it. But wait, <laughs> but wait, let me tell you what it's about. It's about this crazy orphan from a burning. He's like, I'm in. And that's it. He's like, say no to something. God damn it. That's funny. <laughs> well, once so you see skit. Deadfall, there's nowhere else to go. If, if you are, think of yourself as a crazy Nicolas Cage fan and you don't see Deadfall, do yourself a favor. It is Deadfall? His, Deadfall is directed by his brother. It's the only film, Chris Coppola, with Michael Bean as the lead. And I asked Michael Bean behind the scenes when I met him. That was the first question. He was not very impressed that that's the one thing I want to know because he <laughs> had a terrible time on it. But it is like halfway through Nick isn't in it anymore and the movie just falls dead. But before that, apparently his brother didn't say anything to him. So directing him, just let him do anything he wanted. And this is the most coked up performance. I'm not saying literally. <laughs> I have no idea if he really was. It's the most ludicrous thing you'll ever see. It makes the bees look sedate. Wow. The bees! Uh, trust me, watch Deadfall and you'll be well rewarded. Have you seen the Left Behind poster that just came out? I, I heard a lot of it, yeah. <laughs> I, I have not. Is yeah. he the Left Behind movie? Yeah, the religious. They, they did a remake with him as the lead. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh my gosh. Yeah, the poster just came out this week. Um, two quick names I want to throw out comedy-wise before we wrap mm-hmm. that up. Um, number one, I always give a lot of props and love for Jim Carrey. Yeah. The, the early stuff, because I remember I was a huge fan of In Living Color. You know, I yeah, me too. always watch on TV. And it was funny, the drummer of my band, Steve Joseph, shout out to him. Uh, it was my best friend. Uh, you know, we made music together and stuff. It was hilarious because we went to school and everyone would be like, you look like that white guy from In Living Color. Mm. He had a very similar, um, mm. you know, kind of comedic off the wall sort of thing. But, you know, all those movies when they came out, you know, uh, I think it was like 96, 97 when he, he broke with the Ace Ventura movies. Mm-hmm. I just remember that time period as being like the first Ace Ventura came out and it was a huge hit. Everybody loved it. And then The Mask, Dumb and Dumber, which is still one of my favorite comedies. And there was just like this little shift in comedy in general. I remember when the second Ace Ventura movie came out, they did so much vile, over the top crap in it 
that I had never seen in comedies at that point. Him vomiting into a bird's mouth or uh, being birthed out of a rhino's ass. Like, this is some vile ass shit. And I remember it because it paved the way for the Farley brothers. Yeah. Because after that, like it's because of those early Jim Carrey movies and especially like Ace Ventura two, that they were able to get away with their something about Mary. Right. That makes sense. And yeah. that whole period of comedy was, it was, there was an interesting time for comedy in general because people were going for some really weird, gross out humor. And it reminded me of the time period um, that my brothers are so a uh, big fan of, which, you know, is like Porky's and bachelor mm-hmm. party and revenge of the nerds and those type of movies. It was like, we had a little resurgence of that weird wild comedy at that point. I loved, I thought the mask was brilliant when I saw it. I remember oh, yeah, loving loved the it. mask and loved that, it. I wish one day we could hopefully get the filmmaker behind that to talk you about horror know. films. You but we, we don't know. We will, but that's the goal. It'd be amazing. <laughs> uh, you sorry. just got me totally excited because you reminded me of a movie that I had seen when I was in high school that I have not seen since called high strung. And this is not the Mel Brooks movie. This was a movie made by Steve Odenkirk, I think was his name, or Bob, hold on. Bob Odenkirk, Steve. No, Steve Steve Odenkirk. Yeah, he wrote one of the, um, I think he wrote Ace Ventura 2. Okay, well, Steve Odenkirk had done this movie, and it was pretty much just him ranting in his apartment, like his girlfriend dumped him, and then it was pretty much like his stand-up routines, but in it, he keeps ranting about how horrible his life is, and he's at war with his neighbor who lives above him, who is Warren's lead singer. Janie Lane (laughs) and death. He keeps getting visions of death and that death is going to come get him. And death is played by Jim Carrey in it. And he is the most fucking terrifying thing in the world because all he is like, whenever Steve Odenkirk closes his eyes, he sees Jim Carrey there, like contorting his face. This movie had to be early nineties. And hmm. I don't know if it's ever been released on anything. It makes but, sense. Yeah, but it was, yeah, it was called high strung. And I remember loving it. Jim Carrey's time. first feature film was one. Earth Girls Are Easy? Yes. I knew, one of, I knew one of you would know that little piece of trivia. <laughs> Did I the remember. Deadpool come out first? He's in I, the I, I'm pretty sure it always says that his first Earth Girls Are Easy. I remember yeah. seeing Earth Girls Are Easy. And it was definitely his first, you know, talking role. Um, I got to find no, a copy the, of this, High this, now. Yeah, the Steve Odekirk uh, thing makes sense because they, I think they did t- like some kind of TV or stand-up stuff together early mm-hmm. on. And I just remember that because, uh, you know, he probably did that High Strung movie with him early on. And then once he became successful with Ace Ventura and then The Mask and then dumb and dumber like three hits in a row he hired him to direct or he got him the directing gig on ace ventura okay. 2 and i always thought that was cool i was like oh he went now that he was a hit and you know he got to do a sequel he got one of his boys from that he came up with to to direct the, his next movie so nice. i said that was cool um i'm just gonna fire five actors yeah uh, go for it kurt russell michael keaton robert mitchum warren oates Betty Davis and Sam Neill. I'll watch anything any of those people Holy do ever. Smokes. So those are the actors who I like. It doesn't matter what you're in. I'll watch. I watched every Kurt Russell comedy. Overboard, huge fan. Loved doesn't overboard. matter what. Yeah, it doesn't matter what I Kurt Russell is doing. I love all of those. Yeah, she needs food. Yeah, it's an amazing. Those are amazing films. I just sang about. And it, Kurt Russell seems so fearless when it comes to like whatever a role is. He just seems to have fun with it, and yeah, I love yeah. that. And Michael Keaton. I just think I can't wait to see this Birdman thing, just because I like Michael Keaton so much more than the director. I'm just curious. Yeah. What it's going to be I'm, I'm excited for him um and you know sam neil because russell hundred. also from what i hear doesn't realize how cool he is or like yeah. you know like he i heard he's a pretty like laid-back dude and is completely unaware of our opinion of him wow and because and, i heard a story uh i i uh, i did a um an interview with uh uh rodman flender the director of leprechaun 2 uh-huh. also directed idle hands and stuff like that uh-huh. but he we started talking about movies and we brought up john carpenter and kirk you know kurt russell and he was saying that um he directed a lot of Party of Five, and I believe his daughter, uh, what's her name, Kate Hudson? Uh huh. Yeah, Kate Hudson was, I think, on a few episodes. Maybe, Wait, I don't is remember. Is she married her. to Susan Sarandon? Because I thought that. No, Kate no, no. no, no, no. She's married I'm, to I'm, Goldie, what's her name forever? Goldie Hawn. Goldie Hawn. Goldie Hawn. Okay, yes, that no, is. No, no. Uh, so Kate Hudson is their daughter, but I think this is before she not was not his daughter. Weirdly enough, like his his daughter oh. growing up, but not his biological. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, I guess she was on Party of Five, I think, Uh, unless it's one of their other siblings. But it was Uh before she was like she was under 18 or Uh something. So they needed, you know, when you're under 18, you need a parent on on set. So her parent that showed up was Kurt Russell. And I remember that Rodman was telling me, he's like, it was the weirdest thing because he's just there as like a dad, not thinking it's a big deal. And we're all like freaking out because it's Kurt Russell. And he's like, he's just kind of like at the, you know, craft service or whatever and like watching everything. (laughs) So apparently he's completely unaware of how awesome he is. I think when I'm watching Death Proof, I know that this is the coolest. Like there's just something about seeing him say yes to a role like that that makes you know he's the coolest guy on earth. Well, when he he comes out of the car at the end after the chase, he's like, oh yeah. Yeah, Yeah, there's something about that guy. Yeah, I just, I can't get enough of him. Yeah, Yeah, Um, I love Kurt. If you could have, before we move into like some other, just general favorites, uh, 
any non-horror guest you could have on a show like this? Who would it be? Alive. Well, I mean, we already had oh, Savage alive. Steve. That knocks me off. Yeah. Well, then well, do your dead, be one. dead Okay, <laughs> fine. I put down George Miles just because if but, I could ever talk to one person about film, it would be him because he was there right at the beginning. Yeah. And he is big into spectacle, which is my favorite part of film, which is how the fuck do they did that? And there are so many yeah, things that I still shots. watch on him that I'm like, how the fuck did you do You can do just that? watch that movie, that uh, Scorsese movie. He's good. In- that, that's kind of not the true story. Well, you know, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> close enough. And it's in 3D. Yeah, for me, it's, uh, you know, I mean, we already had Savage Steve. That's kind of the best non horror yeah, ever. Yeah. Kind we of have to do to that, that again. Yeah, I mean, if, if anybody, um, just because, and here's the thing, I'm not even a huge fan of this. I've, I haven't seen all of this filmmaker's movies, but the ones I have seen, I just, there's something special about all of them, and I love them, and I just, he just seems like a really interesting guy. Um, Richard Linklater. I, I mean, was sure you're wow. going to go Re- Brett Ratner. I was just, I saw it in Get your eyes. I saw Brett Ratner here. on the tip of No, nah, man. No, nah, because I really, you know, in particular before sunrise, before yeah. sunset and before midnight have a very special place in my heart. I was there when all of them came out and saw them. But then like, this is a guy that's, you know, done things like, you know, school of rock on the side right. or, you know, obviously dazed and confused. And you look at his career and he's always like doing weird stuff. I'm fascinated by this new movie that, um, yeah, what's kids. it called? Uh, is it boyhood? Yeah. It's or whatever it is every that, he, that he's filmed for the last year. Yeah. Something like that. He's been filming it for years. Um, and then, you know, even like, um, what's the animated one that he did? Scanner Dark. I never saw oh, Waking Life. Waking Life and oh. Scanner Dark. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's like you look at his filmography, you you can't pinpoint him. I can't say Link later, and you're like, oh, yeah, I know it's what like that Rodriguez be. just mm-hmm. like lives within his own bubble way too much. I think, and it, the fact that he's going back to Sin City is a, to me like it's kind it's of like little, really yeah. it's already well, you've done that. I think Link later is like you know the him and Soderbergh were the two who would basically try to make an indie project for themselves and then a studio film yeah. to keep going. And I think Link later is the stronger of of the two as well. I think yeah. he's great. He seems like I'd love to talk to him. He seems like a cool dude. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's a lot, so many directors. I mean, you know, outside of Lynch, who I don't think necessarily is a great interview. I think Nicholas Rogue's probably my favorite director mm-hmm. of just like saying about his films. He's definitely, and again, he might not be a great conversation either, but he's very British and he's probably 80 now, but I, I'd be, <laughs> I would find it very interesting talking to him about film because of the way he put together movies. Right. Uh, the editing was kind of so ahead of its time. Uh, but, you know, it could, there's so many people I'd love to talk to, you know. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them are possible because we live here, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unlike most places, yeah. Yeah, like that is the weird moment when I'm sitting in d- Jump Cut and like somebody that I've idolized forever, like David Wayne, is sitting right there. And I'm like, well, what do I say? I didn't say anything. Actually, I think I said, do you want this plug? Because we were sharing the same laptop plug. So that was my big moment. That's funny. And then you like put out your tongues and they touched and you kind of went, ah. Because <laughs> that doesn't you do that in what Hot American Summer? I don't even oh, recall okay. that scene. <laughs> Thanks. You're just, you're just imagining what you oh, want okay. to I see. Want I do want to see that. Everything tonight. <laughs> uh, besides so. horror, before we jump into like our, if we're doing our top tens, well, yeah, uh, we, we should which are almost gotta, impossible. What do you watch now? Oh yeah, I forgot which, about that. Yeah. I've well, also within that, like, what are your favorite? Because horror is obviously the thing your go to, like everyone's go to now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like, I have a real thing for the two two other subgenres. I would say revenge films always have had a thing for revenge film in okay. any any genre, and mm-hmm. the other is coming of age films always and coming of age can be like the kind of comedies we like but also there's like art house ones where it's that person's first time or like rat catcher is a great scottish movie wow. uh, you broke it down way easier than i, I mean I, yeah. I was just gonna say comedies okay well no, no that's fine yeah no that's yeah. that's yeah. fine i'm just like the and 70s american filmmaking like that right. period but but what you're saying i mean you know coming of age films it's universal yeah you know is. and and that was that was one of the when we had uh, ricky bates on a few weeks ago that was one of the most encouraging things when I asked him, when it comes to writing, do you think like, are my childhood experiences relevant today to kids that are in high school? And he's like, yeah, that's, oh, you know, coming of age is always going to mean something to somebody. Like we all can relate to that. Yeah. And I think I it's the, yeah, I think because as you get older and especially, uh, I think sometimes people call children the great amnesia because you start to forget a lot of what happened before. Even I can't mm-hmm. even remember my child as a baby now. It's gone because oh, wow. you've only got the period there and now. Yeah. But um, one of the things I think is as, as writers, your brain, you have way more information and you're a little further away from all these different periods in your life. I couldn't tell you like certain, like even relationships I've had with certain people. I couldn't tell you much details about some of them, but I could tell you every detail about the first time I fell in love or the first kiss I had or the first make out. Like, and that's why I think coming of age in that period, I think those memories can come flooding back. So I think it's a, a very... Um, you know, uh, fertile ground for creative people to mm-hmm. go directly back to. I think you could be 80 and you could probably remember those things 
like they happened yesterday, whereas yeah. a lot of your life just starts to bleed together, sadly. Yeah, One yeah. of the unfortunate things about getting older, you know, it becomes a little less exciting. It's true. Way, I can't know? remember the name of a lot of guys I dated in college, yeah. but I remember the first yeah. guy I and, kissed. And just and things... Like, of, yeah, being like 13 and dancing with somebody and yeah. just And just also moments. your emotions of being upset or angry or they're burning hottest when you're yeah. first feeling that when you're 16. Yeah. Then when you're, you know, 30, it's like, you know, you're, yeah. you become a lot more like, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, and I, I agree with you on yeah. revenge, although I, I would I would say vengeance. I, I love yeah. films that, I don't know, there's something cathartic and, mm. and satisfying about, and that's why I love all the Korean cinema stuff, because that's like, that sets up some really messed up shit, but then pays it off in, you know, in vengeance. And then at the end of it, you're like, was that really satisfying? I mean, did, or did both sides lose more? I mean, it's, and I it's think they're that fascinating films. Yeah. I don't know what, where they can, I just started to look at a lot of the movies I loved, including, yeah, you just got to see Coffee. Um, oh man, what, a, what and that's you know that's one that's bill. sometimes in my top ten, sometimes because having keeping it a top ten is impossible. Wait, coffee is in but the black exploitation film. Yeah, or? yeah. Okay. yeah. Coffee, I, I, had, they ju I just went to a double bill with Scott Reynolds of uh, of um, Foxy Brown yeah. and Coffee. Coffee, I had seen because I I confused them both. Is that it, the one with the helicopter? Is there a lot of a helicopter in one? No, of them? Coffee. Coffee is the one okay. where she's just like straight up out for revenge on the guy who like basically hooked her brother on drugs, and she is just like unstoppable. And I love that movie. Yeah, yeah. So much. There's, a little, there's a little jet. In my brain. There's a little jet, a private jet. No, there is a helicopter at the end of Foxy Brown that Sid Haig drives. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. They're both great, though. They're blending. I don't like Foxy as much. I, I like it, but it's like, there's something about coffee that to me is like it's a great, great movie. You know, what? I got I got to tell you, the middle of Foxy Brown, in between the movies, I went uh -huh. to get popcorn, and there was a conversation with the concession guy and, and one of the guys that works there that may, reminded me of Rebecca. Oh um, God. Because we're talking about Foxy. They're talking about Foxy Brown. It's like, oh man, wait, was that your first time seeing? What'd you think? He He's like, oh man, it's pretty good. You know, it gets a little dark and rapey in the middle, but then it gets back to normal. <laughs> I swear, I started a word. I hear it used yeah. now and I'm like, did it just like, did society as a whole start using rapey? Right. Yes. I also use cunty, but I don't know if I can say that quite as much. On yeah, I don't know if that's going to catch that's, on that's as quickly. That's my adjective. You'll be, you're yeah. fine in the UK. <laughs> in, the, in the UK, you're totally good. Are you going to bleep me out, Parker? Nah, okay, I'm good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I get burned out on, um, narrative films mm. just because I, between all of my work with Fango and all of my work trying to finish up all of my academic endeavors, mm -hmm. I am watching anywhere between two to three movies a day. So by the time that I actually have downtime, I watch television and okay. I watch copious amounts of it. And usually it's comedies, um, Futurama, it's always sunny, calm community before it just ended children's hospital, South park, Archer. And then when I'm not watching that, I'm watching documentaries, like mm -hmm. science yeah. documentaries. If somebody makes a documentary about a, uh, like a giant squid discovered, I will watch that mm -hmm. shit like crazy. Yeah, um, documentaries are great. I still watch. So I'm really, it's just like if Nova has specials out, I'm watching it. If And uh, things like Cosmos, I've been watching a lot of. Um, and then I'm also, if I have like, you know, nothing else to do for the weekend and I can watch a narrative film of my choice, I watch giant big action films where things explode in their spectacle. I've told you guys before the national treasure movies fucking love them. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, I, feel, I feel like we have our comfort movies as yeah, well. Yeah. Those are definitely that... my comforts, like die hard movies, you yeah, know, yeah, die fast and the furious things exploding and flying at my head. I love. Yeah. So. Wait, Interesting. Yeah, I, I, we we didn't even don't uh, even. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm gonna sub subtweet where, that one. Where so is you your brain hear. tonight? I swear. <laughs> That's like, where my brain always. We talk lives. about high school, and your brain's back there. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, uh, yeah. This. I, I wanted to do quick recommendations before, and then we could throw out top tens top or whatever 10. if we wanted. But uh, in terms of uh, the two things I wanted to recommend, if you don't already know of these films, but um, you know, one of the first foreign film directors that I. I fell in love with. I'll say his name wrong, but it's okay. You'll correct me. Uh, Christoph Kieslowski. Kieslowski, yeah. Yeah, and that... that the, he's definitely up there as one of the greatest... Oh, my God. That that seen. came through my love of Julie Delpy because, you know, uh, I discovered, of course... White? You know, uh, yeah. White mm. was the first film of his I went to. But, you know, you know, because she was an American werewolf in Paris and, and then, you know, obviously before Sunrise and, and Killing uh, Killing Zoe. Yeah, Killing and, Zoe. So, you know, I like Zoe. Movie. Julie Delpy was starting to pop up and I'm like, who is this actress? I'm, I'm in love with her. And then I, I went back and found White and it's just, you know, it's funny, like... I had had my first major heartbreak. It's, it's a tough movie, that one, in terms and, of I being mean, set upsetting. The, the timing of it yeah. was like, like literally, I just had my first major breakup, and then I watched the movie White, which is all about the pain of that. 
Uh, but but then it's a celebration of life and kind of it's also got a, a, a weird revenge style to it too. But the it's it's just a beautiful movie. I haven't seen it in years. I picked up the. Did the, you go back and see the other two? Of course, I, yeah. I love. I recommend Three Colors because there's three movies yeah. in order. It's blue with uh, Juliette Binoche. Yeah. White is the middle one, and then red. Uh, Julia and, um, Armand. Who yeah, is gorgeous. And they sort of. I mean, they don't really cross. I mean, they 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 have similar themes, but it's a great it's a great trilogy of films. And uh, I really love them. I just picked Criterion, put them out. I just picked up the Blu-ray versions of them because it's been years since I've uh, revisited them. And uh, actually, yeah, in terms Red, of, sorry, Red isn't Julia Armand. It's um, this French actor. Let me. She's from Double Life of Veronique, which is another film of his, which I all equally love. But this did what just remind me of something. Do you guys have a movie that you had a bad experience during, and to this day, like like somebody broke up with me during Friday? And to this day, if <laughs> anybody mentions Friday, I fucking Oh, you, I do have one. I still I remember do, I do it. Too, yeah. so, yeah. I have so one. Funny. It is Irene Jacob was the actress. Sorry. Um, no, mine is uh, one I hadn't. It didn't see. It was huge in New Zealand. Like the biggest movie. Us. Smoking Barrels to Lock, Stock, Lock, and Two, oh, really? two Smoking Well, barrels. and I hadn't seen it. And I saw my, the girlfriend at the time who I'd been with a long time. Uh, she never went to the movies without me. Like I'd never seen. So I went to America uh, and we we're probably going to end anyway. Cause I, you know, I can't you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, but I came back <laughs> and I came back and caught her in one of those like lies where you're like, Oh, and you don't say anything. Like, so she, somehow I came out, we went to a video store. I said, like, Oh, we should watch Lock, 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 Stock and Tube. And she goes, Oh yeah, I already saw it. And I, I remember going, Oh really? And somehow it led to me realizing she had seen it with someone other. Uh, and it slowly it led to our breakup. And I hadn't even seen the movie. And it was like the slow downfall through a movie. Which have was you pretty, never watched it yet because uh, of No, that? I did. I did years later. Oh, yeah. okay. But I, I watched it after it was cool. You know what I mean? So by the time I actually saw it, I was like, yeah, it's all right. But it wasn't. Right, if I'd seen it at the time where it was time. like amazing. Because Guy Ritchie is the ultimate post Tarantino director. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he is, you know. And I think that first, I don't know. Yeah, I, first I haven't really fun. liked anything yeah, after okay. that, really. I didn't get that yeah. into but it. But I do. I have that same story. The same the same breakup where i found was white it with friday because that's uncanny god i wish no. <laughs> uh no and it's i didn't see the movie we were supposed to go see the romeo and juliet the one with leonardo dicaprio uh-huh. Uh-huh. oh uh, there's so much water imagery it's so yeah. beautiful and she went with somebody else on a date and i found out Son and of that a was kind of when i was like wait are, does that mean we're done Aww. so i have that association where because again it was first major major breakup so i was like i can never watch romeo and juliet now because that was the movie we were supposed to see Aww. now i don't care anymore but yeah isn't that the weird thing like there, there's no such thing as a good or bad movie right because <laughs> ultimately it's how you saw it or when yeah. you saw it yeah and it can trans you know a whole movie can just become a whole different thing yeah. if you're in that certain mortal mindset combat is awesome because i went on a really good date to see mortal Kombat. <laughs> So it's a great movie. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, yeah, I'm, that's uh, Mortal Kombat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I remember the game. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's some movies that, you know, won't necessarily, there's a lot, like when I talk about Revenge, I love Get Carter. If people are looking for great, great recommendation, one. Get Carter is like, I think one of the best uh, yep. revenge films. Um, I love, uh, there's a film called Deep End, which is, we talked about The Shout once on here. Mm-hmm. Uh, a guy called Skolomowski, uh, who was, uh, who wrote Knife in the Water with Polanski. Um, he made a film called Deep End, which I think is one of the best coming of age films, but it's not available in America. It's in, it's an, on the UK uh, import and it's just brilliant. Like it's really dark and weird and it's just a great, great movie. Um, but there's some, you know, there's, you start looking, I already knew as soon as I showed up today that I would break out in a cold sweat two weeks from now with the hundred movies that I've written oh down. Oh my on God. List. There's so many, I mean, we're not going to touch superhero movies and I, I fucking yeah. love superhero movies. Sam Fuller. I mean, I haven't <laughs> even like, you know, naked kiss. There's so many movies by these directors, but the coolest thing about tonight is that I can't wait to tweet that on the latest episode of killer POV, Rob mentions Kieslowski. That is like, to me, <laughs> yes, perhaps the greatest <laughs> moment in my you, life. And, and let me ask you listeners after 60 episodes, did you, ever think I was going to Did you think he would that? bring it up before me? No, right? because I did. that's like one of my favorite directors. <laughs> wow. Actually, one of the best Rick? books on film I've ever read is Kieslowski on Kieslowski. That and Herzog on Herzog wow. are priceless books Wow. Uh, if you're looking for them. But um, so I think that's, that's pretty amazing. good. Another guy won't make my top 10, but he, a director, his early stuff's incredible is Adam McGoyan. Adam McGoyan, who just did The Devil's Knot in the last like 10 years, I'd say has become like very vanilla. I don't know what's wrong, but every film he's made, it's like almost good and it's just not good. Mm -hmm. But those first like maybe decade of his work and he's from Canada were just fascinating. Uh, Exotica. There's just like these movies, but the one I liked is called The Adjuster. And it's a really dark, messed up movie. Uh, I think. I think if you. I think there's a box set of all his early films, and I think people would really like that stuff if you're into horror. I think. Uh, and film noir is another big passion of mine. Mm-hmm. So things like Out of the Past with Mitchum, there's connections to genre stuff in there because yeah. it's so dark, you know. 
Um, but yeah, there's you know too many movies we'll ever be able to list all of them here. I one more recommendation, and I promise this is my last one before we go to top tens. Um, here's a comedy. It's it's a weird comedy, not a documentary, but it was made that way. There's a film that not a lot of people know about from several years ago called Last Stop for Paul. And I love this film. I was, what happened was I was in, uh, uh, this is back when I lived in New York, there was a, a, um, a Long Island, uh, film festival. And the way that it was broken up was, uh, you know, you had to buy a ticket for a, 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 you know, a, a slot and it would be four short films and a feature. And you know that you bought your ticket and that's the slot that you saw. So my friends had made a short film that was playing in this block. And of course I went to go see it. And, you know, I don't remember the other shorts. Obviously my friend's short was really good. Um, but the feature that was paired up with them, they were all kind of in the comedy realm anyway. The feature that was paired up with it was this movie called Last Stop for Paul. And it was really weird because it's 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 made almost it's it's shot almost like a documentary. Like whoever the guys that made it, I think his name is Neil, let me see, Neil Mond uh, Mant. Neil Mant. Um it's like they bought a bunch of digital cameras mm. and shot this themselves as if it was a vacation video, if that makes any sense. And essentially this guy, Neil is like this world traveler. It, you know, he works a regular, uh, you know, a regular office job and it kind of leads a boring life. But what he loves to do is he waits for vacation. He likes to, he doesn't want to go and do the basic, Oh, I'm going to go to some resort or something. No, he goes to like, he wants to go to Thailand for their, like their giant, like, you know, festival thing or whatever, or, you know, you know, parts of Japan or just different parts of the world that nobody goes to because that's exciting. That's, that's what you should be doing, living your life. Um, and it seems like that's, it's almost seems realistic. Like, mm. you know, that he really does do this thing. But anyway, the short version of it is, um, you know, they set up, uh, you know, that he likes to do this and he invites one of the guys at his office to come with him on his next trip. And, um, the guy that he invites, uh, his best friend passes away and, um, you know, he has a profound effect on him and, uh, he, you know, his father gives him his ashes saying, you know, he really, before he died, he really wanted to go on a trip around the world. And, uh, so finally he's like, you know what, I'm going to honor my friend. And he goes to this guy, Neil, that's always traveling saying, I'll go with you to Thailand, but two things, why don't we make it several weeks and we're going around the world tour. And then, uh, I'm bringing Paul with me. We just want to spread his ashes on each part of the world. Cause that's what he wanted before he died. And it's kind of this beautiful, you know, it, you know, it's, it's, it, I'm sure there was a mild structure to it in terms of like, there's no script, but I feel like they've picked locations to go to met locals and they just shot weird random scenes with them. Mm. So the comedy comes out of just meeting random dudes. And like, that's the fun thing. Like, you know, there's one part where I think they're, I, I want to say Spain or something. And they just meet these Irish brothers at a bar and they end up like, you know, going out all night with them and stuff. And that's kind of, I don't know. There's something exciting about that. Like, especially when you travel. I mean, even when we go to conventions, you meet people and you have these experiences with them. And, and I don't know, stuff you know what like the word is, that kind of stuff is like uplifting to me when, when you get to experience that and seeing it in film is, you know, even better. Yeah. So. I think the word, um, and I own the camera, I came across the quote and I posted, I tweeted it today was, it was by, I think it was like Bergman, but then somebody else said it and they said, cinema doesn't have to be real. It just has to be alive. Yes. And I think the word, when you're describing that movie to me, it sounds like a movie that makes you feel like it's alive. Yeah. It's not totally. dead. And you know, sometimes you'll see a beautiful movie. I think Bertolucci is a director. Uh, I admire his films, mm. but I think there's something like dead in them because it's all style. And it, a, after a while, like the conformist is this big stylish movie, but there's something about it that it's not alive. It yeah. feels like it's a guy walking through beautiful sets. But, and I think if you can make something with a handheld camera, a digital camera for no money, but it feels alive. Yeah. It's what elevates uh, how you feel about a film. Yeah. I mean, it feels like it has production value because they're going all over the yeah, world, right. it's a but that was kind. probably their budget, like, you know, in terms of how to do it. And, and they put kind of a weird little scam to make it mm. cheaper, which is fun. But um, yeah, last stop for Paul, um, I don't know if it even if it even properly got U.S. distribution. Mm. When I saw it at the film festival, I found it online and bought a DVD off of the filmmaker. Mm. And there was a chunk of time where I remember seeing it on Netflix Instant. So I would do a quick search if you're interested. It, it might be on Netflix still. If not, maybe it's on Amazon. Some you know, maybe mm. they're still selling it themselves. Do you have it? I do. Oh, yeah. just go to you Rob's. Go, or <laughs> I'm going to go to Rob's. Ask for me for it, yeah. And because everyone and their mother and probably their mother before me. <laughs> Fuck your mama. Uh, has bought possession. Um, <laughs> the the 64, which I ordered yesterday. Uh, and I will you. get. But uh, because that is, it will probably, you know, spark a little interest in Zulowski. Uh, some of his films are available on that same thing. And because it's not a horror film, this one isn't. And uh, I, I, you have to get a British version. But he has this, I think his other best movie is his first film. It's called Third Part of the Night. 
and it's a it's basically a film of more or less about what his dad went through during the war and it has some of the craziest i mean for one it's just pure him mm -hmm. but it's also it's an incredible movie very atmospheric but they did these weird tests where like how they would survive uh, the war would be working for these doctors who are creating these little, I get, I wish I knew what, I wish I could show Becca cause she's the entomologist. Uh, but you know, has, <laughs> I think they, they might be leeches or light. There were these things that they would basically put blood in them and they were basically using them to experiment on themselves. Uh, and that's how they survived the war. I, I need to look up. They what the survived kind of, the war with leeches. Uh, no, by working for these, by making these experiments with these insects. I cannot remember what they were for the life of me, but it was the most baffling thing while I'm watching well, the now movie. now you have to tell me because I'm oh, totally intrigued out. to the point that I have to it'll find be, out It'll right be quick now. to find out. But it, it, it's, it was so disturbing because no one was saying what it was for while I'm watching it. And mm -hmm. then the movie ends and I'm like, what was that exactly about? Because it was really kind of just a hypnotic, I mean, it set the scene as like, honestly, I, I know it sounds like I'm overdoing with Zalowski. When you watch his first film, I would honestly be like, like, who is this voice? Like this, I haven't seen a voice launch onto cinema quite like his did. Um, it never really caught on so much over, over here, but um, I'm Googling Zulaski bug experiment. Yeah, no, no, just look up his first film, third part of the night. He'll tell you it's like, they're not leeches. They were like these little lice, maybe it's something to do with lice and blood. But anyway, then there's a little interview with him on the extra feature. And he basically explains what exactly that, that was biographical, what his father did. And that's how he survived the war and paid for his kids. And it's just like, it blows your mind, you know, wow. war films in general. I wouldn't say I'm a big war film guy. Like I think apocalypse now is really one of the most incredible things about what war could feel like in a surrealist kind of way. Mm -hmm. But, but when I see a great war film, it, they always kind of like knock, uh, come and see is probably the most powerful I ever. So, uh, that Russian, the one that was controversial for being on the timeout top hundred horror oh, films, yeah, but it's, it's not a horror film. It's a war film. Wow. That's I remember horrifying. the picture of it in the yeah. top 100 yeah. because it was, um, a Low guy's, born. uh, it was just the, the upper torso and then a skull on top yeah, it's and a, it intrigued me enough to see it because it's an amazing picture. film. It, yeah. It's an amazing film, but it really isn't a horror. You know, I'm pretty loose with the term horror. It, it's horrifying yeah. for sure, but war films are their own thing. You know, they really are. Um, so yeah, I don't know. And, you know, hey, quickly Tarantino's favorite movie. Just what's your favorite Tarantino? Oh God. Um, shit. Do we count true romance? Yeah. Okay. If you want to be true. Wrote. I mean, it, writing wise, true romance. Uh -huh. Um, I still think Pulp Fiction's his smartest. Pulp Fiction's pretty great. Jackie yeah. Brown's still my favorite, but I, I think Pulp Fiction's maybe Pulp Fiction suffers because it was so great and, and so popular. So uh, sometimes you, know you look I, back and go, I will oh, say, yeah, so I don't know if you had the chance to see it, but I will say Kill Bill, The Whole Bloody Affair. I never saw it all together. No. As one film, mm. it is a fucking masterpiece. Is it a different edit? Yes. Oh. It's, it's slightly different. It's a Shorter? slightly different. No, it's not. Sh well, a little, I guess, because it's a slightly different edit. The whole scene with the crazy 88s is in color and it's mm. absolutely insane. It's just, you know what it is? It's, it's hard to describe, but like when you see it in two movies, it's, it feels like two very distinct movies. But when you think of like, he made Pulp Fiction, he followed up with Jackie Brown, which didn't, you know, people critically like it, especially now, but it yeah. didn't have the no, at same, the time it didn't do. at the time it didn't have the same power. Then he disappeared for four or five years or whatever it was. And then if you look at Kill Bill as his follow-up movie, as one movie, mm. He came back and literally put everything he's ever loved about film into one movie. And that you period know? where he's missing, though, he did the Grindhouse. No, no, that no, was no, after. He did. He did Sin City, part of Sin City, right? That was after. Really? Yeah, yeah. After both Kill Bills. Kill Bill was like 2004. I remember oh, the trailers yeah. for that. Yeah, huh. yeah. That and was there was a big chunk. I mean, maybe some acting and stuff, but I doubt. What it. was? Did, does anyone know why he wasn't? Doing anything? No, he was just writing. Yeah. I think I think he was writing Kill Bill. Mm. But uh, yeah, they showed it at the New Bev briefly for a quick run for his birthday a few years back. And as a single movie, I mean that's the, that's a the thing. It's like when you see it as one three hour movie, every technique of filmmaking. I mean, you know, there's anime, there's oh, so you know, it's only martial three hours. Art. That's not too bad. Oh, whatever it is. Okay. Yeah, it's something like three, three and a half, whatever it is. But it's it's just it plays much better as one feature S certain things are a little in a different order it's definitely a slightly different edit. i wonder if they've ever done jackie brown i mean um foxy brown jackie brown double that would be really hey, fun yeah. to see them back to back yeah. would be really fun to yeah. see her age and then to see sid haig in the yeah, small role yeah, I forgot about that. that's yeah. actually dream double feature now i, I would love to see wow, those there two we back go. Back. okay oh. yeah, jackie brown i just fell in love with i think it's a charming I, I'm looking forward to revisiting because yeah. I have the yeah, box I set now. Seen it and it's a great it LA movie. Out. I think it's one of my favorite LA movies, just yeah. about LA. And it's, yeah, no, it's and the best soundtrack. It just, I, I just can listen great, to that yeah. anytime. They yeah. were lice, and the, uh, lice. the <laughs> disease that he'd been immunized against uh -huh. was typhus, yeah. which made sense. Okay. So. Yeah, it's a really cool movie. 
All right. Well, I mean, we could go on forever, but why don't we just yeah. shoot out like our top 10 yeah, lists top or whatever. Yeah, top 10, which is basically impossible because it changes all and the time. And most of which yeah. we mentioned, but Becca, go ahead. Okay, number 10, Maltese Falcon. Oh, you're going backwards? Yeah, I didn't even number them. Okay, fine. <laughs> Wait, are you starting at 10? You can. He has his numbered. Okay. Yeah, yeah go backwards, um, whatever. Okay. Maltese Falcon, number nine, this is Spinal Tap. Number eight, Vanishing Point. Number seven, Indiana Jones. I'm putting Trilogy. Nice. Um, number six, Muppets Treasure Island. Number wow. five, Last Boy Scout. Number four. Whoa. Cool. Yeah. I Holy know. shit. Oh, that's way up there Hold on the my phone. list, motherfucker. Last Boy Scout is an atomic. I got to see this yes. now. Yeah, you really do. Jeez. Okay. Number four is a tie between Clue and Drop Dead Gorgeous for me. Um, number three, Hedvig and the Angry Inch. Wait, Drop Dead Gorgeous? Is that that? The comedy. Where they are infiltrating a... Beauty pageant. Oh, Sandra Bullock? I lo- no. No, the girl who was with Charlie Sheen? Yeah. I love that movie. I, I'm, I feel like I've seen that, but I've seen bits of it. It's hilarious. It is such a dark comedy. Okay. All right. You got to see it. Who else is in that? It must be someone else. Um, yeah. Why can't I remember her name now? Um, crap. The, Blonde ended up becoming kind Denise of Denise Richards is one of them. Denise Richards is the bitchy Wild one. Things. Yeah, I remember um, that. But there's a whole bunch of like major people okay. in that. It's it, including the chick from Witchboard 2 that you love so much. Oh, nice. Amy Dolenz. Okay. Is, I think is. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she's in that, too. Um, My mind is blowing. Top I know. three. You got to right. see it. Okay. <laughs> I'm so impressed. Hedvig and the Angry Inch, number three. Number two is anything Star Trek okay. uh, TV and What's your movie. Fa- yeah, what is your favorite Star Trek movie? I mean. God. Okay. I, it yeah. shouldn't be. I know it's not. I love it's, Six. I love that Undiscovered one. Undiscovered Country. I that's pretty great. It's pretty what? great. I do. What? Yeah, no, wait. That's not the one that Shatner directed, is it? No. Oh, you're talking about the Spock one, right? It's the last one that Spock's in mm. and Leonard Nimoy directed it, The one that they came to Earth? Uh, no, it's, it's, I, I Kim Cattrall's in it as a Vulcan. Yeah. Huh. That's, that's I think like, the one where they come to earth the, is just it's amazing. It's the last one with the original crew. Okay. You mean the one with the whales? Before generate. I love the one with the whales, but Khan's the best. Number two is like yeah, one of the great movies my ever by made. Far. Um, that one kind yeah. of, it almost ranks up like it's Star Trek or Star Wars level for me, just because it's got so much fantasy elements to it and creatures and everything. And so, yeah. a great comeback. Cause one is so boring. Yes. Robert yes. Wise's. Yeah. Yes. It's just dumb. And number one for me, point break. Whoa. Oh. Whoa. Whoa. Just, <laughs> Gary Busey for the win. Yeah. Give me wow, two, I don't even Utah. I don't even Canada think we is. should go. I think that <laughs> that was such a mind blowing top Utah. ten. Like what is so great about this episode, like what Rob said at the start, is that we really didn't have any idea what you watch at, outside of horror when I think about it. Like I knew you watch a lot of comedy TV stuff and I know Dave's really into comedy. That but was, I'm kind of no, but Dave is we have such different tastes because Dave will watch stand up and like he loves Louie. And oh, I, um, love I like Louis. Louis see, I don't. Louis it Chita. depresses the shit out of me. Yeah, Every I single time I'm watching things. it, I'm like, oh. <laughs> like the only things we Real agree life. on are Archer and maybe Arrested Development. Okay. Aside from that, we cannot watch the same television shows. I so. think my taste goes. There was a quote in a movie by Fassbender once, and they're watching a depressing film, and one of them goes, "Oh, I hate depressing films." Goes, oh, no, I love depressing films. Every time I watch them, when I go back to my life, I just feel so much better. <laughs> and I think that really sums up oh my, my taste. Yeah. Do it. Uh, who wants to go? Me or you? You go. My right. mine are silly, so I had lots of like ringers on each one. Uh, okay, well, number ten, I think uh, it could be Walkabout by Nicholas Rogue. It could also be Bad Timing by him. Both mm-hmm. great movies. If you haven't seen Walkabout, it's stunning. It's the one set in the outback, in Australia. Number nine, uh, this has always been in my top ten, and I was so excited. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get Bob Murawski on the show one day. But uh, his wife especially pushed for the release of this film called The Swimmer uh, with yeah. Burr Lancaster, and it's always been uh, an oddity. I'd say one of those cinema audit, like how did no one really knows about it. That's going to change now that they just did this beautiful Blu-ray transfer. I was watching the d- documentary last night, mm. and it's it's just a really unusual, slightly surreal movie. Uh, but Burt Lancaster's best thing he ever did, in my yeah, opinion. I want to see it. Uh, number eight, uh, we talked about it last week, and I just got the Twilight Time finally, finally getting it's coming. Bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. Mm-hmm. It's my favorite Peckinpah film, and I'm I like a lot of Peckinpah, and it's my favorite. You I think need it's, to just yeah. marry Dave. It yeah, I know. I, I do like her husband oh when it comes to that. Uh, number seven is one of the most beautiful films in the history of cinema, Harold and Maud. I will oh never get God. sick of we that film. Own, we have a VHS and a bootleg it's just, import copy it's just, of that. It's just, you know, <laughs> if you've never seen Harold and Maud, do yourself a favor, because that film is just the best, you know. I mean, it just opens with this young boy sh- committing suicides in a number of different ways. And you yeah. at first time, you're really quite shocked. And then you slowly realize he's this kind of depressed kid who hangs out and at funerals and for friends and older women. that the character? But court? Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. We do have Harold and Maude, but uh-huh. I'm confusing it with Reuben and Ed. Sorry, okay, different, backing oh. off. No, and Bud movie. Court uh, grows up and ends up being a small character in um, what is the Bill Murray one, Life Aquatic. Okay. Steve Zissou, he's the small role in that. Uh, number six, uh, Monty Elman. Everyone has heard me talk about him. Two Lane Blacktop. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, it's one of the 
the great American movies, in my opinion. Number five could easily be my number one. Sometimes it's my number one, sometimes number five, Night of the Hunter. I think it's the best uh, one-off film by any filmmaker. I and it's almost untouchable. I consider that horror. It, can, uh, it's, it's like a fairy tale. It's really, I mean, it could come under horror. And but, I would argue that Vanishing Point's better than Two-Lane Blacktop. But, but not, even, not even close. Oh. Uh, maybe <laughs> for fun. American. Uh, maybe. Uh, but uh, number four, Blue Velvet uh, oh. by David Lynch. But that could easily... Oh. I would say the same. Yeah, could well, Blue Velvet... Potentially horror. Mm. No, no, no. no. That, that, that wouldn't be in the horror category. Uh, you, there are all, a lot of these movies you could call have horror elements. But Blue Velvet... Lost Highway, in a way, is the one that I like. Like, when I watched it, most, like, just messed me up. But there's something about Blue Velvet. I think it's the most Lynchian movie. I think it's mm-hmm. the one where he, he perfectly expressed what he wants in cinema, yeah. in my opinion. And I think it always holds true. The, number three, I've got two films that probably most people here won't have heard. But they're very they're similar. One's called Verkmeister Harmonies. Uh, and the other one's called Stalker. By, one's by a Russian guy called Tarkovsky. Uh, the other one is by Belatar, a Hungarian film. They're all made up of long takes. And they have the kind of tension that I've never seen a horror film that w- can even come close to what these two films have in tension, but it's high, high art house cinema from the 70s. And what's fascinating about them is the second time you watch them, the power is not there anymore because the power is all in not knowing where it's going. You yeah. have no idea what's around the corner. The, the tension, I've never felt like the, the way I felt watching those two movies um, and just beautiful <laughs> soundtracks. Great movies. Uh, I've never not wanted to see some films so much. So yeah. As soon as you say it, they're entirely <laughs> yeah, long takes, I'm like, <gasps> well, they're all, yeah. They're, and they uh, only work once. So I, I, like, think, oh, I think Burkmeister Harmony is made of like 33 shots. It's like a two hour movie with like, and each one's like an eight oh minute. Oh my God. And they're all, tra- they're all tracking shots. They're it's all like, like an anxiety attack it for is. me. Yeah, it is. Well, it's like, this is your top three? <laughs> that, I mean, Burkmeister might be the best experience I ever saw watching a movie where I was my like, God. whoa. It's like The Shining. It's like. <laughs> It's but like not with a narrative. In traffic. Yeah, but you'll no, never watch it not again. A, it's nothing like that. No, I've watched it. I've watched <laughs> oh, it a bunch okay. of times. I just mean the tension you feel when you watch something and then you once you know where it's going. Right. When you watch it a second time, especially Stoker, I remember first time is like the best movie I ever saw in my life. And then I watched second time I was bored. Mm-hmm. But it's because of and who cares? You know, that's what yeah, they yeah. but if you get a chance to see either of them, especially on the screen, uh, you'll be blown away. And then my top two movies are to- always back and forth. A Place in the Sun is a uh, Montgomery Clift falls in love with uh, Elizabeth Taylor and he, but uh, unfortunately marries Shelley Winters and then basically decides he might want to kill her in a boat and try <laughs> to get Elizabeth Taylor. It's the best. I think it's the best American movie, like flat out. I think it might be the best movie of all time, in my opinion. Uh, it, I had an interesting, I read a story about John Cassavetes once, which rings true about how I felt about it, that he went to the movies and he saw a place in the sun and walked out going, oh my God, what a piece of shit. And then he took a, a stop for a beat and walked back in and saw it four times in a row. He, like he, he <laughs> just, and became like, oh, that's the best movie ever made. And there's something about it. There's buttons. That to, it's the best close up in the history of cinema where you feel a desire. I've never seen desire portrayed. So it's a very Burns hot kind of movie about Montgomery Cliff. Uh, it's strange that he was gay in real life because him and Liz Taylor were good friends, but you really believe everything. And then my number one, uh, it, you know, probably always will be is, is Vertigo. Now, Keep in mind, there's not horror on this list because Vertigo and Shining, to me, are basically uh, probably tied as the best two movies ever made Wow! in cinema. The yeah, Shining's always up there, but this isn't horror. Vertigo is a film that every time I watch it, there's, there's still some parts which I don't like about it. All the scenes with his friend character I find kind of dull, but otherwise, I just think that movie's, you know, cinema uh, doing all the things cinema can do. And James Stewart just, you know, what the hell? That wow. performance is just nuts. So I'd say me and your Mar- me and your list could go toe to toe. Surfers to be the biggest a bank, Elric. Yeah, Come I don't. On. I, I, I don't. Know. I guess you're right. <laughs> I don't. I don't have a number order though, so I'm just going <laughs> to shoot. Right, yes. And they're and, you know they're questionable. So sorry in advance, but uh, uh, I'm going to uh, shoot them out. Well, we already had Becca's list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Drop dead gorgeous number three in the whole world of the no, history no, of cinema. No, no, I'm not saying these are the ten best films. I'm saying no, no, these no, are ten mine. favorite yeah, yeah, yeah. films. There's no such thing these as best. These are the ten films I could watch okay. in repetition over and yeah, over and be fine. perfectly right. content for the rest of time. Then my, then my, li- my list is awesome. Okay, uh, so I already mentioned True Romance, uh-huh. Better Off Dead, uh, Teen Wolf is still one of my nice. all-time favorite nice. movies of ever, the original, Karate Kid Part 2. <gasps> I'm doing the drum thing right now just for you. I like it more than Part 1 because the <laughs> wow. stakes are higher. Because she go, he That's goes, why 3 doesn't work. All right. Part yeah, one 3 is, it doesn't work. Part 1, it's a coming-of-age story where he learns karate and he That's bites at a movie. tournament. Uh-huh. Part 2, it's to the death. And it's got Kamiko, <laughs> and Kamiko was hot. Yeah, she was a hot Asian broad yep. that he hooked up with 
in Okinawa. Okinawa. It's the origin of Mr. Miyagi. And he, instead of learning this the crane. This is mind blowing to me. It's instead amazing. of the crane, you put two above he one. learns the drum. He learns the, the drum, drum thing. I'm it's doing great. the move right, right now. If you were here, you would learn the drum. He tries the crane kick right off the bat. Gets there's no cobra con. down. There doesn't have to be a cobra They're at the con. beginning. Yeah. Uh, they're at the opening. They're in the opening. And they're actually like good guys in the opening. No Elizabeth Shue? No. Oh, in the opening scene. Yeah. But that's it. Which wow. apparently was shot for part one is their ending. But they decided to end the movie early, apparently. Okay. But yeah, it's uplifting. Uh, Desperado. Robert Rodriguez. I enjoy it. Love it. Yeah. It's one of my, it's one of my top... In a time before we had comic book movies, it's like one of the best comic book movies ever made without actually having a comic book and just super, you know, I mean, you know, and then you look at the, you know, like Steve Buscemi's great in it and all that. It's so. fun. I remember of, of Rodriguez's movies. It's my favorite of his by far. Yep. Still his best film. Uh, Shawshank Redemption. Oh. Okay. Anytime it's on, no matter what part, got to watch it. Mm. Uh, the Princess Bride. Oh, good film. Love nice it. Film. Sorry. My heart just melts it. Oh, yeah, as you wish. Go back to Dropped It. <laughs> <laughs> I need to watch that now. Weird weird Science. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good By call. far, Good my call, favorite Grable. John Hughes yeah. one. Uh, believe it or not, La Bamba. La Bamba. I love, love it. I love, oh. actually, I love biopics in general. Uh, yeah, I do too. Yeah. And I especially say, like. music ones. You know, I love the Buddy Holly story as well. But, you know, like La Bamba was at that period in my youth that I didn't really know Richie Valens at all. It was just, it was a powerful movie. You know, I gotta watch it. I watched it when it first came out and I was way too young. Like I didn't really understand what was going on or the power of the music or anything. I was definitely like middle school or probably even younger. I need to rewatch it. I'll be changing my tweet now to this is the episode where (laughs) Rob talks about La Bamba and Kieslowski. (laughs) (laughs) I'll be like, who would have thought this happened on a show called Killer POV? Yeah. And lastly, as I mentioned, actually, uh, I mentioned it's before Sunset, which is the second of, of that one. The second one is by far my favorite of those three and it only because it's, yeah that's a I, funny I, one. I personally relate to it the most i know you know the first one i saw when i was, was that at that age and optimistic about romance and all that stuff the second one is a more realistic slightly bitter but hopeful kind the of the second one's like, like a perfect movie yeah it, it's a very because it's also very simple not yeah. a lot happens and it's and, a perfect kind of sequel without and having it's also a, a film sequel. made of up of long takes it is. It's They're all long great. takes of them walking and talking. I love before. Does that sound like being stuck in traffic to you? It does. It really okay. does. I, I love before say. midnight, but I'm just not at that stage yeah. in my life. Yeah, I, I hope I'm, I'm still not. In, no, no, <laughs> I'm probably exactly. borderline. Maybe I am. I'm still more so, in the before There's sunset. a lot of truth in all three films. They're just, you know. And, and you know state. what? One, one thing I want to ask you guys, I've had this conversation with Brian Collins before, but we, we have at one point had a conversation about arguably the five perfect movies. Mm. Meaning you can't argue that they're kind of perfect. Here's the list. Although we, the oh, fifth ooh, one, I'd have to think about mine. We don't have the fifth, but, but no, listen to these. These are perfect movies. Jaws. Yeah. yeah. Perfect yeah, movie. Definitely. Die Hard. Yes. Yep. Back to the Future. Mm-hmm. Okay. Shawshank Redemption. Yep. Yeah. And now when I, we need, we never could agree on a fifth one. I say Pulp Fiction. I kind of feel like those top five are like, those are five pretty perfect movies. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't have qualms with any, if anything, I'd feel like the, the least rewatchable for, pardon me, for fun would be Shawshank. Not because it's, it's a perfect See, script. I yeah. think Shawshank's a perfect script and a perfectly made film, but it's not the one I would, it, the, all the others, if they're on TV, I'm going to watch them. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Like Jaws, Die Hard. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, still watch- I was thinking about this today that there are certain types of movies that I absolutely love and I will say, oh my God, it's a great movie, but I will never rewatch it. And Shawshank's that type for me. I'm that way mm. with a lot of dramas where I'll see it once and I'll be like, yeah, that was a really good touching film. I will never fucking watch it again. I'm telling yeah. you, if, yeah. if it comes on on cable or TV, whatever, in any point, it's like, I can't not get drawn into it. Uh. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I've. It's no more unpleasant than say like Stand by Me or any. any you know, See, stuff I, would, like that. I would never. But I watch. love Stand by Me. We, maybe for the fifth weekend, like Dirty Work. Hey, I, <laughs> I didn't mention it, but that, it's in. No. It's yes, in my comedy yes, list. I knew oh, Dirty Work oh would be on so many. Dirty Work is on my comedy list. That's the best. Sheen R. Oh no, work. I'm thinking no, that's the, Men at Work. Yo, men at Work. I'm thinking the Norm Macdonald Did movie. Did you it's seriously just pull out Sheen and Estevez? Yeah, Men at Work. Oh, I thought that was called Dirty Work. Good too. Dirty Work. Me and Neil. I love Dirty Work. Is that wow. the one where they uh, where Jeff Farley gets in a bar fight at the start because of the um because of the uh, karaoke machine? What's it called? Yes, because the Saigon whore bit the tip and of goes, his nose off. We are number thirty seven, and then sings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I love that yeah, film. Yeah. That's, great now, film. What's That's a great your, one. What's your Christmas movie? Everyone has like Scrooge. One, Scrooge. I, I, I Scrooge. Scrooge. Always Every every Christmas really? Eve. Oh, I love Scrooge. We do Scrooge. But Two we hours also, before midnight. Scrooge. Emma Otter's Jug Band Christmas. 
It's pretty great. It's, that one makes me sad every time. I, lo- I love it, but it makes me sad. It's so sweet. I, I don't remember Ernest at all. Ernest That's was okay. It wasn't, it's not as good as this Halloween one. Or yeah, any other quick jail. fire topics before? Yeah. I mean, the funny thing is, you know, those top five you just said, like Jaws and that? That's the weird thing. We make our top 10 lists or whatever. And really, yes, those movies would all be in my list. You know what I mean? But I don't do it because that's in everyone's list. Mm -hmm. It's more like what makes you somewhat more idiosyncratic than the next person. Yeah. And I think that's kind of how you, but you're right. I mean, look, I can't believe Jaws is is an all, because it is. That's a a pretty perfect movie. I was also thinking today about movies that you hate, like no matter what, you will hate this type of movie. Like for me, anything with Rob Schneider in it, I'm really going (laughs) to fucking hate it. But I was trying to not be negative because there's a couple sub genres like that where I can be like, it doesn't like weepies. I always call them like the terms of endearment style movies or, you know, they always get me though. Like whether I like them or not, I remember seeing what the Kevin Smith's terrible, like Jersey girl. Yeah, on a plane, I, 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 I was on a plane and I had tears I on my face. So I was yeah. like, "What is going on?" Those are the ones I like about it that I always turn off because I think, I, and this could just be me, but I'm always like, "It's so easy to make somebody cry." It is. It's a lot easier. And to... Like I just saw a trailer for that one called "The Fault of the Stars" or "The Fault of Our Stars" about mm. the cancer patient coming mm. out, and it's one of these movies where I'm like, "I'm just not even going to bother even watching the trailer because it makes me angry from the start." So I'm not going to see it. Yeah, so. I I, le- I mean I like to let go and get super emotional with movies because I mean that's the whole point. There, you know, it's entertaining. But you know, I, I want I like to feel stuff when I see movies. So I I'm not one of these people that picks apart you know plot lines and you know all all kinds you know. I mean, are you listening, Mike Williamson? My yeah. dog Skip <laughs> made me cry for about four days. Actually, I'm tearing up right now thinking about it. So thanks, guys. <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, Jaws, I will say one thing because we didn't talk about what we saw this week, but I did see that I finally saw that film Milius. A lot of people have been watching. Oh yeah, about yeah. John Milius, who wrote. There's a, the, a great part of the documentary is where he talks about how he, he like Spielberg goes, "Hey, can you write me a? Uh, I need a monologue," and he like in one night delivers the ten page Robert Shaw monologue that Shaw then had to cut down himself because he's like, "I can't read that many words." Yeah, and then he cut it down to like five pages and just knock it's one of the best scenes in cinema history it's amazing. amazing to think that comes from some guy hey quickly write me a monologue i mean milius's character in that film he, he made conan uh he did big wednesday he's just one of those and he wrote apocalypse now it's one of those larger than life characters but part of it is he creates this weird enigmatic almost caricature right-wing gun-toting character about himself that mm-hmm. kind of kills him in hollywood a, a bit yeah because it's obviously a liberal place but it's definitely worth watching it's not like a brilliantly made film but it's very interesting, especially because we're not, this is a non horror yeah. perfect one. And I'll tell you about an amazing situation that happened. Duke Mitchell, who I'm a big fan of, the film I saw, Gone with the Pope. Yeah, which I'm dying to see. I was to see. dying I have a to see. I've poster of it in my living room. Well, I've been dying to see the one before it called Massacre Mafia Style. And one of the things that Grindhouse has kind of purposely done, not done to make these films more special mm. is to not release them. Yeah, we like, own Massacre Mafia yeah, Style. Yeah, but you guys have an old original yeah, VHS yeah, release. The ex- when it was the execution. A lot it's, of called, cuts. it's called uh, like El Bosso or something. Yeah, there's like a couple that. of different. Like yeah. Father, like Son. And the I'm only going to tell this story because we're talking about movies. And I think sometimes. Things happen in the cosmos that are kind of magical. I, you know how we did the thrill of the hunt. I wanted to see that film really bad, but I wanted to see it on theater. Uh, this is two nights ago. I'm like, basically, I put on three. I never do this. That's why this is such a great story. So I haven't been able to see this movie. I put on three different movies. I started watching Pain and Gain because everyone had liked it. I watched 20 minutes. I was like, eh. It was like it felt like Wolf of Wall Street, but in Florida. And so I turned that off. Then I tried watching a TV show on Netflix and I turned it off and I was just like, yeah, I get it. It was like, it was almost midnight or most, almost 11. I was like, I guess I'm not going to find anything that good. And TCM, it says coming up in 10 minutes, Ma- Mafia, Massacre, Massacre Mafia style. And my jaw drops. I go on Twitter and start going, oh my God, anyone near TV, go see this thing. And then I see on Facebook that Murawski had just said it. And it blew my mind that it was. And then I watched it and I had heard that it wasn't quite as good has gone with the Pope and it's like this version's restored and gorgeous like it must be the one Bob's gonna eventually release and it's one of the best films I've ever seen wow. like it is he has more wit and wisdom in one scene with Duke Mitchell because it's like he made it because he didn't like believe the Godfather he watches the Godfather and he goes eh, that's a bunch of shit he, this is like a, <laughs> he's like a crooner like Sinatra but not knowing he wasn't a guy who was famous right. and he took all his money from his clubs and he made a movie an independent film for like you know 28 grand or whatever and, he, and it just opens with him them blowing away like 20 people just literally the montages him singing a song them knocking on doors and just blowing people away with like machine guns wow. and, it, and it ends but then there'll be like one scene in all his movies where it'll just be this long philosophical thing about Catholicism and the problem with being mafia and Sicilian and we've been pigeonholed and we got to bring it back and we shouldn't be violent. And you're watching it going, man, there's more heart in the scene than anything in any of the Godfather films. Wow. And I cannot say enough. You should hunt 
And we and I bet you if we can get Bob on, we'll find out. I'm sure they're going to be released at some point. Yeah. But they are just great movies, and I, I'm genuinely surprised because sometimes I feel like you've seen all the great stuff. Mm. And this is this guy's indie before there's really you know that was kind of a thing you would do, yeah, yeah. taking a huge risk on making movies. Um, and it's just they're brilliant. And I think anyone who loves you know American indie at crime stuff is going to flip for that stuff. Because uh, I thought there were jokes. I Before, when I heard about Gone with the Pope, just maybe based on the title and everyone was going to it, I thought it was some sort of joke movie. Mm. Kind of like The Room, like, oh, we've discovered this bad movie. Yeah, it's not. No, These not are just all. like great cinema. You know? yeah, yeah. So anyway, it was. But it, it, that gives me hope. And I think we talk about movies and you get burned out and sometimes we get burned out on horror. And so when things like that happen, it's mm. all. It's just like, per, like, oh man, I can't see anything else. And the movie I've been hunting for comes yeah. on TV. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, great. So. Well, I saw Oculus this week, but I'm oh. going to save it. Oh, yeah, for save next it. Save week. it. Yep. Maybe we'll try to. Actually, me and Rob, maybe we'll try to see it before then, and that way we could all discuss. I've heard it's divisive. Maybe. Yeah. It is, I'd say. <laughs> it's definitely like I have. It, yeah. It's divisive. So. All right. Cool. We'll try to see it. All right. We'll see you next week. We will be back with a horror show horror. called Killer POV next week. But we might start doing a spinoff <laughs> about <laughs> 80s comedies. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll see Thanks you Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. <laughs>